Golden Age Radio is starting now. Subscribe to get future updates. Buckle in and prepare for a great lineup tonight, starting with The Twilight Zone, Zero Hour, Suspense, Mystery Theater, The Inner Sanctum, Theater 5, Escape, X-1, Dimension X, and Space Patrol. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Thank you, Mrs. Dunphy. I'll be back shortly. You're going out? I'm afraid so. But you've only just returned. Unfortunately, that is the nature of my work. Another business trip. The most important of all. But first, there are arrangements to be made. If prepared your afternoon meal. I'm sure it will keep. Can you not make these arrangements by telephone? No, no. Some things can't be left to chance. In the meanwhile, follow my instructions precisely. To the letter, Mrs. Dunphy. Do I make myself clear? I believe so. You believe so? Then let me make it absolutely clear. <sighs> Sit down for a moment. But if you're on your way... It's necessary that you understand. And the only way to be sure is to tell you how it began. Please. If you wish, sir. I must warn you, it's an incredible story. I of all people know that... So incredible that you won't believe me at first. But I'm going to tell you everything. Then you will believe. Because you must. You must believe. Do you know Central Europe? Europe? Only as a child, sir. It started there many years ago, after the First World War. I was on a walking tour of France, Belgium, and Germany. I, I decided to travel alone with only a small pack. <laughs> The Confidence of Youth. Germany was magical then, a place of valleys and mountains and swift, dark rivers. There was nowhere else like it, a fertile land where everything grew tall and straight out of the earth. I was struck by the richness of the soil, the verdancy of the hills. Stepping across the border from Belgium, where the Mustachioed guards saluted like tin soldiers. I entered a different world. Everywhere I looked, a swelling green ocean. On the farthest hills, tall, ancient buildings of stone. Estates, monasteries, castles, or what have you. Some of them in ruins. I stood a moment at the border and watched the hawks circling above, wondering how such a miracle could be. It was as if I had passed through an invisible door from a musty room into a magical kingdom of winds and light. But so much can change in an afternoon. By nightfall, clouds filled the sky and the storm moved in to darken the landscape. The nearest village was miles away. I was unprepared, dressed for a, <laughs> a stroll up the Champs-Élysées, perhaps. In minutes, I was drenched and chilled to the bone. Then I saw it, a medieval castle, bombed almost to ruins, sitting like a broken fingernail atop Schwarzhof Mountain. I came to a wall of gray stone. It was an iron gate. Please! Please! <laughs> Summoned! <laughs> Please let me in! A story told years ago by a man who recalled it from his youth. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, he was never able to put it out of his mind. 
It begins with a wayfaring traveler. His name is David Ellington, a scholar, seeker of truth, and to his dismay, a finder of truth. A man approaching exhaustion, who will confront a problem that has haunted the world since the beginning of time. A man who knocks on a gate, seeking sanctuary, and instead finds that he has just crossed an unmarked border into the far edges of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Howling Man, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I found a rope by the gate and pulled it. Please! Someone! Yes? What is it? Let me in. I'm sorry. You, you don't understand. I'm traveling on foot. We don't allow visitors. I'm not a visitor. Uh, what is this place? It's called the Hermitage. And I'm a stranger caught in the storm. Your, your robe, the, the cross around your neck. You're a man of God. I'm lost. Don't you understand? Lost. Very well. Follow me. Thank you, brother. <coughs> You're ill. I'll be all right. Once I dry out. <coughs> this way. What are these rooms? A barred window in each door. They look like, well, cells. All are empty now. I see, but but what were they? Wait here. What for? I'll speak to Brother Jerome. Who? What in the... Brother Jerome will see you now. Oh, what was that? The wind. Are you sure? Come. The room had almost no furnishings. A straw pallet, a rude desk and chair, some books and religious oddments, very stark. The abbot himself was a fierce El Greco painting of a man, stooped and withered, but strong in every part of him. Like the monk who came to the gate, he wore a shepherd's cloak and carried a crooked staff. Why have you come here? My name is David Ellington. I got lost in the storm. <laughs> then I saw a lantern in the window. And what is it you want of us? Want? Only a little shelter, some food. We cannot help you here. You will have to leave. You call that a Christian attitude? No, Mr. Ellington. Oh, for the love of... All right, if that's the way you want it. Sorry to have troubled you. <laughs> Give me a minute. <clears throat> I'll be out of here in... In... Brother Christophorus. Yes? Carry him out of here. At once. Right away. I don't know how long I remained unconscious. When I... I came to, I was in a primitive cubicle, one of the cells. Walls and ceiling of gray stone, a single small window in the shape of an arch, the floor hard-packed dirt. The monk sat nearby in a chair. I lay under a blanket. Beneath me was a bed of straw. Water! He lives. God's infinite mercy. How long have I been here? Nine days, my son. Nine? Days? You were very ill. The fever was on you. Brother Jerome said you would die, and he sent me to watch over you. I have never seen a man die. He holds that it is an important teaching, but now I suppose it was not your time. Sorry to disappoint you. No, my boy, don't try to rise. You must rest. What in the name of heaven is that? In the name of heaven? Nothing. I, I mean the scream. Scream? That. What? Are you deaf? That cry, I heard it before. You said it was the wind. Ah, the wind cleanses the land after a storm. But it isn't the wind, is it? I don't understand your meaning. It's a man. Careful. You must regain your strength. There! Don't tell me you didn't hear it! 
Perhaps you would like some soup. It's cold, but nourishing. What I would like, brother, is to leave this place. I'm afraid that's impossible. What do you mean? Only that you're not well enough to travel. And of course, you won't be well enough to travel as long as you think you hear such sounds. Now, the soup. I, I don't want it. Open, please. There. That's better. Over the next few hours, my strength did return, or at least some of it. I waited until the monk had fallen asleep. Then at last I made my move. The door was held shut by a simple iron bolt. I had only to slide it a few inches without waking him. I was almost free. But I could not remember which way we had come. When I turned into another corridor, I realized I was lost. It was a maze of dark passages and doors. Here, a part of the ruined ceiling was broken away, and I saw that the moon had risen. In the naked light of the moon, I saw one door different somehow from the others. At first, I was not sure why. Then I realized that in place of a bolt, it was held shut by... A piece of wood, a mere stick, crooked and curved, like the peculiar staffs carried by the monk and the abbot, only in miniature, no greater in length than, well, than my forearm. On this door, in this door alone, a small wooden staff replaced the iron bolt. How odd! I looked through the opening in the door. Inside, a filthy, shadowed hovel. No table or chair, no straw for a bed. It appeared to be empty. What? There was a man, huddled in the corner, holding his knees and rocking, head back like an animal. In the soiled moonlight, I saw his dirty beard, his, his rotted clothes. Who are you? Help me. Stay back. No, please. In the name of humanity, help me. But who? You're not one of them. No, my name is Ellington. I'm an American. Shh, shh. What are you afraid of? Them. Listen. Do you hear them coming? No, but why? They will look for you. We only have a moment. You speak as if I'm a prisoner. Aren't you? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Come closer. And I'll explain. Explain what? Don't you know what they are? These men of God. They are mad, Mr. Ellington. All of them raving mad. Why do you say so? I was in the village in Schwarzhof, doing nothing out of the ordinary, walking the street with my woman. We were holding hands. That is all. Do you see anything wrong with that? Well, of course not. But what... We pause to rest by a tree in the shade. And then we kissed. Yes, I admit it. Is it wrong to kiss? Tell me. Why, no. I don't think so. You don't think so. I don't think so. But Jerome, that lecherous old fool. The gaunt man. The one in charge. So, you have seen him. As I kissed her, a shadow fell over us. We looked up and saw him standing there. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could utter a word, he raised the wooden staff he carries, so heavy. You've seen it? Yes. And he hit me again and again. He smote me <laughs> like an angry god or a man who thinks he's god. I woke up here. No. I swear, they flogged me with knotted ropes. I asked for food, they would not give it to me. I begged for water, they gave me none. Then they threw me in this filthy room and locked the door. Whoa. Why? For revenge. Jerome wanted my woman. Are you sure? Yes. That disgusting old man, that fanatic. He wanted her. And when she refused... His advances, he took his fury out on me. Uh, your story, I find it difficult 
to believe. Of course you do. That's the strength of the man. He makes his madness seem a harmless thing. The beliefs of a religious zealot. But this, this is not a religious order, Mr. Ellington. These brothers of truth. Is that what they're called? That's what they call themselves. The real truth is they're outcasts, misfits, cut off from the world because the world will not have them. Have you heard of their sect before, of this hermitage? No, I, I haven't. Mr. Ellington, you must believe me. I don't say they're all evil, only mad. And here, within these walls, they answer to no law but their own. Wait for me. Where are you going? I'll speak to Jerome. No, you mustn't. If I remind him that false imprisonment is a crime... I tell you, he's the greatest maniac of them all. Quick! He's coming. Hide yourself. Mr. Ellington. No, no. <laughs> Brother Jerome? I did not know you were well enough to walk. I, I still feel weak. Uh, Brother Jerome... Come with me, please. Look here, I... This way. Where were you going? I was looking for you. It was unwise for you to wander on your own. The corridors can be treacherous. Oh, can they? In what way? The building is very old. One might trip and fall without a torch. Or go where one is not meant to go, is that it? See something perhaps that you're ashamed of? I do not know to what you refer. Don't you? Oh, then you don't know the grounds very well. I saw something just now that violates the law of this country and of humanity. I must ask you... And I must ask you, Mr. Ellington, to leave the Hermitage at once. We lack proper facilities to care for the ill. You certainly do. Arrangements can be made in Schwarzhof. Uh, just a minute. No, not a minute. Not an extra second, Mr. Ellington. Now. I thought you were concerned about my health. I am. But now you want me gone regardless. Why? I have explained that. You've explained nothing. Based on what I've seen, I question your motives. I question your entire operation here. You are making assumptions. I certainly am. Now, look, no one invited me to come here. I realize that. I arrived unexpectedly, and you're not prepared for visitors. But I had no choice. And there is no excuse for your behavior. I suppose it was only a matter of time before you brought out the knotted ropes so that you could flail me or whatever it is you do for amusement. My son. I'm not your son! There are many things you don't understand. That's right, I don't. So begin with this one. Tell me, why are you in such a hurry for me to leave? What more are you afraid I'll find out? More? Besides the man you've got locked up in that cell. What man is that, Mr. Ellington? The one we just left. The one who's been screaming his head off. I am not sure what you're talking about. That's it, isn't it, brother? Or is he only one of many? Well, it isn't a secret anymore. I know. And what do you think you know? I... Uh... <laughs> I... The chair. Sit. You are still weak. Brother Jerome, I know very little about this cult of yours. What's permitted within these walls, but I doubt very seriously that you can imprison a man against his will. That is quite true. We have no such authority. Then why have you done it? No man has ever been imprisoned at the Hermitage, Mr. Ellington. He claims otherwise. Who claims otherwise? Who do you think? The man in the cell at the end of the corridor. There is no man in the cell at the end of the corridor. I was talking with him. You are talking with no man. And you think I'm hallucinating? Mr. Ellington, you are ill. You still have a fever. In such a state, delirium may cause one to see and hear things that do not exist. Do you mean to tell me you don't hear that? 
hear what? Look at me. Dreams can seem very real. And honest men make unconvincing liars. The brother who's been caring for me... Brother Christophorus? Yes. He has a way of looking at the floor when he tells me I'm imagining things. You look at me, but your voice loses its command. More imaginings. I, I don't know why, but you're both very intent on keeping me away from the truth. What do you know of the truth? Which is not only poor Christianity, Brother Jerome, it's poor psychology. Because now, I'm very curious indeed. Curiosity is a dangerous thing. Oh, I was taught it's a sign of intelligence. There are some things best left alone. Like sleeping dogs, a nest of snakes. I'll uncover the facts eventually, you know. Meaning what? Just what I say. I imagine... The local police will be interested to learn that you're keeping a man locked up here. I tell you, there is no man. All right, let's forget it. I'll deal with it in my own way. And what way is that? However I see fit. It's no concern of yours now. Oh, and I apologize for not dying. Maybe some other time, brother. Mr. Ellington. A last word? Bon voyage? <laughs> Don't bother yourself. I'll make it to the village with no further delay, I assure you. Mr. Ellington, the, the prisoner in the cell, it's a delicate matter. Ah! So you admit it. A terrible thing. He's violent, dangerous, more dangerous than you know. We are obliged to lock him in the cell. I'm sure you can understand. I understand that you're still lying to me. Goodbye, Brother Jerome. Would you really go to the police? If you were in my place, wouldn't you? Very well. Close the door, Mr. Ellington. I have told you the truth, but only a part. Now I see that I must tell you the whole of it. May God forgive me. Then you do hear it. As I have heard it every hour of every day. For five long years. Why did you lie? I didn't. Oh, but I think you did. And now the skies darken. The storm returns. I should have known. When I told you that no man screamed in the abbey, I spoke the truth. It is not a man, you see, Mr. Ellington. It is the devil himself. You're joking with me, aren't you? No, Mr. Ellington, I am not. Would that I were. It would be so much easier. But the prisoner in the cell, our only prisoner, is in fact Satan. Oh, come now. Otherwise known as the fallen angel, Ariman, Asmodeus, Belial, Diabolus, the devil made manifest. You asked for the truth. Now you have it. Do you believe? What? Oh, sure. Hmm. Now it is you who are lying, Mr. Ellington. You don't believe me at all. To the contrary, you're even more certain of what you've suspected all along, that I am mad. Well, sit down. I will tell you a story. And then we'll see how certain you are of my madness or of anything else. Drink. Uh, what did you say? Some brandy. For thy stomach and thy infirmities. Uh, no, no, thank you. Don't worry. It's not poison. A very old vintage. I'll drink with you. What is it you wanted to tell me? I presume, Mr. Ellington, that you consider yourself sophisticated, a worldly man. Why do you say that? You're young, rich by your clothes, and reasonably well-educated. Harvard? Yale. Exactly. Having a last fling before settling into the family business. How did you... You are an open book, printed in very large type with pictures of course you consider us primitive because we are living in seclusion away from the real world to you we are misfits please I know all the theories I assure you brother no Mr. Ellington it is I who am assuring you that I am not the ignorant fanatic I might seem I coped with your world for 40 years before I left it and rather successfully by your standards. The best schools, a degree in philosophy, a job that took me to all the corners of the earth. 
This beard and this staff and this face represent nothing but a different point of view. If you understand that, then perhaps you will listen to what I have to say with an open mind. Go on. Five years ago, there were no screams at the Hermitage. This was simply the bombed out ruins of a castle belonging to the family Wolfren. How did you come by it? Baron Wolfren turned it over to the Brothers of Truth as a gesture of charity. Our task was to tend the great vineyards and save what souls we could by constant prayer. But this isn't a formal religious order, is it, brother? We believe that we are recognized by God. Truth is our only dogma. We are committed to it as man's greatest weapon against the devil who is the father of all lies. Please, continue. You were tending the vineyards. At that time, not very long after the Great War, the world was in chaos. Everywhere there was unhappiness, except in the village below. Really? For some reason, the people of Schwarzhof refused to yield to despair. They lost none of their faith. They continued, as they had for years, to be honest and God-fearing and happy. The village was a plum to Satan, one he could not resist. So he came here, drawn to it as a moth is to light, and embarked upon a program of corruption. But you stopped him. Yes. You see, Mr. Ellington, he made the same mistake you are making now. He underestimated me. He thought he would have no difficulty tempting an old fool. I had him in the cell before he knew what happened. But if he's the devil, how do you keep him from escaping? With the staff of truth. The one barrier he cannot pass. Mm-hmm. And when he first came, just... How did you recognize him? I had seen him before, in every part of the world. Wherever there was sin, wherever there was strife and persecution, there he was also. Sometimes he appeared only as a spectator, a face in the crowd. But he was always there, in all times and places. So you understand now, I trust, why you must say nothing of the things you have seen and heard. Brother, not that I doubt you, but... Is it possible that you've made a mistake? No. Think, Mr. Ellington, of the peace in the world these five years. Think of this country now. Is there another like it? But you haven't put an end to suffering. There's still murders and robberies. Even now, while we talk, people are starving. The suffering man was meant to endure, my son. We cause much of our own grief and need no help from him. It is the unnatural catastrophes, the great wars, the overwhelming pestilences, the wholesale sinning that we have ended. The world is rebuilding. A great dawn will come. Enough. You've made your case. I believe you, brother. Do you? Truly? I admit I was doubtful at first, but you've convinced me. Absolutely. I promise to keep your secret. Good. Tomorrow... If you feel well enough, you may leave. For now, let the storm pass over. Brother Christophorus will look after you. If you would, go directly to your room. I will. Good night, brother, and thank you. I was glad our conversation was over. It was clear that he was quite mad. I thought of his wild beard, his eyes in the flickering candlelight, and I was relieved to be away from him. The devil, indeed. But the storm had returned, and I was not yet fully recovered. I would pass one more night in this place. What, I wondered, should I do before morning comes? corridor was dank and empty. I felt as though I were the last sane man in an insane world. What Brother Jerome had told me was utter nonsense, the product of a deranged mind. But his belief, his faith, as he called it, was heavy in the air, infecting the very stones. To bring it down would require outside help, but 
Perhaps I could start that very night with an act of pure, unselfish humanity. Psst! Are you in there? Where else would I be? I thought you weren't coming back. I had a meeting with Brother Jerome. What did he say? He lied to you, didn't he? He said that you're... Go on. What? The devil. <laughs> the devil! Oh, oh, that's good. That's wonderful. What a dream for an old man. Himself a devil. To catch Satan and lock him away in this godforsaken place. You don't believe him, do you? Of course not. Then help me. If I let you out now, while they're awake, they may catch you before you leave the grounds. There's always the possibility. But another hour here, you don't know what it's like. Look here, why don't I just go and get the authorities? When? As soon as morning comes. I'll find the path to the village and... No! It would be my death warrant. The authorities will return and find nothing. Who knows what will have happened to me by then? Jerome is mad, but he's shrewd, too. He won't leave any evidence behind. Then, what can we do? You must let me out now. There doesn't seem to be a lock on your cell, only this small shepherd's staff. You could almost reach through the bars and remove it yourself. I've tried. It's wedged in such a way that I can't get my fingers around it. Here, I think I can get it. <clears throat> Quickly! Wait! Brother Christophorus! There you are. Brother Jerome was fearful. You might lose your way. No, no, nothing of the kind. Come along. I'll light the candle. There is bread and water on the table. And more soup to give you strength. Thank you. Rest now, Mr. Ellington. Remember, you're still a very sick man. I'm feeling much better. Nonetheless... Brother Jerome has asked me to watch over you. Really, that isn't necessary. It is my duty. The chair is sturdy, and the candle is fresh. Wait a minute. Why are you locking the door? To protect you. But you're locking us both in. Never fear. I have the key. It is not long till morning. But... Sleep, Mr. Ellington. You are a weary traveler. Soon you'll be back with your own kind. What a comfort, eh? You will forget all you have seen here. I watched the monk as he sat heavily in the chair. I was a prisoner, no doubt about it. How much longer, I wondered, for both prisoners. What if the morning came and Brother Jerome chose not to release me as he promised? I might remain here for... How long had the howling man been imprisoned? Five years? Lord, I imagined my beard growing, my hair wild, until I too was starved, crying to be let out and no one would come. Who knew I was here? I'd drop off the face of the earth, forgotten, presumed dead. Brother Christophorus had the keys around his neck, but until he fell asleep, I was at his mercy. It was almost dawn when I dared to move. I had to be careful not to wake him. Yes, I finally had the key. I locked Brother Christophorus in the cell. There was no time to spare. I knew I must release the howling man before I left the hermitage. You come. Good. What do you want me to do? Lift off the wooden bolt. Ah. Are you sure this is all that holds you in? A small carved stick? Yes, lift it off, I tell you. But surely you could have forced the door and broken it. Please! There is no time for talk in the name of mercy. If you fail now, they'll kill both of us. All right. Hurry. I'm trying. I just need to slide it. Oh, God, the latch. <sighs> Mr. Ellington, where have you gone? Hurry. Hurry. A moment. Stop him! Stop him! Now! Brother Jerome, come quickly! I am free. Stop! I command you! The other way! Now! Here is the gate. It's locked. I must get over the wall! I'll put my hands together. A hoist! Step up! Let not Satan escape us, O oh Lord. Let him not sow the seeds of evil throughout the world. I call upon you. Up! Now! 
stepped in my hands and climbed the gate. Now, reach down and give me your hand. Help me. Help you? Help you, mere mortal? <laughs> Are you mad? And I saw, not the foot of a man before me, but a cloven hoof in a flash of lightning, with those horns grown suddenly from his forehead. Then he turned and vanished in the moonlight. I am sorry for you, my son. What was he? As long as you live, you will remember this night. He is gone. Who? Tell me. Even now you're not sure. But you will be. And then you'll know, Mr. Ellington. You'll know who it was you loosed upon the world. <laughs> The monks were mad, I thought, or the howling man was mad, or I was, or the whole world. But Brother Jerome was correct. I could not forget. And when the pictures of the carpenter from Bromau Alm Inn appeared in the papers, I grew uneasy, for I felt I'd seen this man before. And when the carpenter invaded Poland, I was sure. And when the world was plunged into war and cities had their entrails blown asunder, and that pleasant land I had visited became a place of hate and death, I decided to spend the rest of my life tracking down the one I had released. Each night I dreamed of it, Mrs. Dunphy, and I kept dreaming through all the wars since. Until this week, it took years, decades, but eventually I found him, and so the nightmare is finally over, again. I see. And now, Mrs. Dunphy, I'm going to see about a chartered plane to have him transported back to Germany. Brother Kostrophorus is in charge now. I have already written him. He will be very relieved. And what you found, it is here? Have no fear. As long as the staff of truth is in place, he cannot leave the next room. The staff is very small, but very powerful. So you see why you must not, under any circumstances, go near that door. Nothing in the world is more important. Do you understand? I believe so. Oh, he'll do a bit of howling, but never mind that. It's a trick. I'll return as soon as possible. Until then, keep that door locked. Yes, sir. Oh, my. Such stories. Come here. Please. You must listen. He is insane. Let me out, I beg you. Let me out. Who's there? Behind that door. Are you... All right. Sir. Sir, can you hear me? The little piece of wood, the staff. Remove it, please. I don't know if I should. Please, take it off the door. I implore you, please. Please. Ancient folk saying... You can catch the devil, but you can't hold him long. Ask Brother Jerome, or Brother Christophorus, or David Ellington. They know, and they'll go on knowing, to the end of their days, in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, 
plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Howling Man, starring Fred Willard, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for the Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Doug James, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio... You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. and the Ford Motor Company. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. Max Roper, private investigator, hunch player, and karate expert is having his problems. Nothing seems to point the way to the murder of his friend, Jockey Willie Rich. What he has found is another murder. That of young Bonnie Burns, the warm and willing receptionist of the Gilded Cuckoo Health Spa. The investigation has led Roper from Willie's murder to Pam Clayton's disappearance, to backtracking into Pam's stepmother's checkered marital career, to a demonstration of Tyler Clayton's expertise with firearms, to the knowledge that there is a mystery man somewhere named Thomas Hunter who may have something to do with all of it. But as of the moment, Max Roper is in no position to inquire any further. He is now a client of the Gilded Cuckoo in a barred room, his clothing locked away, and having just swallowed a prescribed elixir, is in the process of crashing into black oblivion. Is this any way to treat a detective? In a moment, Max Roper will be treated to a ride on a diabolical machine called the Isotron as the Princess Stakes murder continues. But first, this word. Josephine, open up! It's me, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of all France, much of the civilized world, and Louisiana if the deal falls through. Oui, Pierre, hide in the closet. Napoleon must not find you here. Come in, Arpi! Ah, Josephine, I had to see you. Napoleon, my dearest heart, what are you doing here? I thought you were at Waterloo. I was, but it ended early. <laughs> What is that? I smell cigarette smoke. You know I hate you to smoke. I didn't. I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I started a game. Aha! The smoke coming from that closet. Come out of there, you scoundrel. And on court. You put a name there to pick up the dry cleaning. Take that, you filthy cargo. This world history lesson was brought to you by your American Cancer Society, which says smoking can be injurious to your health. To say! <laughs> In more ways than one. I tried to raise my head, but couldn't. 
I heard a soft gushing of voices. My vision cleared temporarily, and I saw a chunky, light-haired man standing next to Glendon. He wore light-rimmed eyeglasses, and I knew I'd seen him before. I knew his name was Dorn, but I couldn't figure why he was looking down at me. I tried to raise myself up to ask him, but there were solid straps of tight canvas lashing me securely to the bed. I didn't need anything more to tell me that once again I had miscalculated my moves and underestimated theirs. I shook my head and tried to growl and fell asleep instead. I was getting pretty good at that. He's coming around. I was on my back, tilted toward the ceiling. Square tiles shifted in and out of focus and finally settled into a pattern that held. I began to understand that I was lying on a tilted narrow board barely wide enough for my frame. My feet rested on an angled slab at the bottom. I recognized the contraption as an exercise slant board used in gyms. I'd been on one before, but never with my arms tied behind the board. Apparently, I was going to be introduced to a new exercise. I looked down past my nose to the straps bisecting my body. My upper torso was stripped bare. Wires were strung along me at intervals extending out of view. Pain parted my scalp. Phantom fingers of metal told me to lie there quietly and not move. He's ready now. I wanted to laugh and tell him he was ridiculous. A million volts of concentrated force hit me in the back. My body tensed and surged upward, tearing the breath out of me. I settled back, nerves quivering and jiggling, and waited for the next one. A strange smell filled my nostrils. I identified it immediately. The musky scent of fear. My cortex knew what my body didn't, that I was going to be tickled to death. I was ready when it came, but it didn't help. The contact wire bit into my flesh. I leaped. Why are you here, Mr. Roper? I could have told him, because I was a dumb dick. We're waiting for an answer. My entire upper left quadrant recoiled in a monstrous heave. I'm sure you understand that your body of nerves will give out long before this machine. Now, I ask you once more, why are you here? I, I, I told you, to get in shape, to take weight off. The contact pad on my left side jumped. Electricity hammered into my nerves and muscles. I twitched like a harem hopeful in a shimmy contest. I shivered and shot uncontrollably. Each contact stimulated another mass of ganglia into pulsed reflex. I expected at any moment a contraction severe enough to snap a bone. What the hell's going on? You, you, you treat all your customers this way? I'm asking you once more. What are you looking for? If you think I'm keeping something back, why haven't you clowns thought of using sodium pedithol? That's supposed to be pretty good for digging out the truth. Yeah, but the isotron is more memorable. It might even deter you from seeing us again. You're wrong, sweetie pie. What I'm going to do to you when I get out, that's the thing I'm going to remember. <laughs> well, let's have one more for the road for Mr. Roper. It was a butte, but it didn't break my back. Dr. Savage came forward again. I saw the hypo in his hand and foolishly tried to draw away. The wires held me in place. My forearm was swabbed and the needle went in. You might like this one. It's PCP, uh, the peace pill. It's good for hallucinations, uh, delusions, and possibly a depressed state. Why are you here? What do you want? What are you looking for? My field of vision began to whirl. Before my eyes, alternate blocks of color. Red, blue, yellow, then checkerboards. And then... nothing. What do the city of Chicago, state of Georgia, Albertsons Incorporated of Colorado, bottlers of Coca-Cola, the Atlanta Braves, state of West Virginia, Kansas City Power and Light Company, Kentucky State Fair, Goodyear, Logan International Airport, 24th Street Elementary School, Los Angeles, Keep Virginia Beautiful Incorporated, North Carolina Highway Department, 7-Eleven Stores, Hines County 4-H Club, Mississippi, state of Delaware, Louisiana State Garden Club, Washington National Airport, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What do all these have in common? They've all joined in and worked with the Pigeon Program to help clean up America. What can your club, community, or state do? What can you do? Write United States Brewers Association, Post Office Box 2570, Washington, D.C., 20013. Let's all pitch in.
Charleston, South Carolina. Garden Colors, Mississippi. Richmond, J.C. We'll return to our story in a moment. This is Gene King for your Better Business Bureau. If you're planning a vacation by air, you know it's a good money-saving idea to check with the airlines to see if you qualify for a special fare. You may be able to save yourself a sizable sum of money, but remember, you must comply exactly with the conditions or you'll be asked to pay the regular rate. Now, most airlines, for example, offer two youth fare plans. The cheapest is youth fare standby. In this, you'll be the last of the passengers called and may not get on the flight. And Youth Fair Reserve, however, guarantees you a seat on a reserved flight, but it'll cost you more. Discount fares are also offered on long-distance travel, but remember there are conditions. For example, you may have to make reservations two weeks in advance, and for some, three months in advance. You must travel midweek only and return after seven to nine days. And no holiday or peak period traveling on this plan. A consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. I awoke to a million ants and grasshoppers doing a war dance across my body. I jerked as the contact pad fed me a massive jolt. My legs exploded. I lurched. Then was aware that the last contraction had snapped the bands lashing my legs to the slant board. Gurgling noises rose from my throat. The white-coated Dr. Savage came over. I waited until he was close, hooked my right foot between his thighs, and drew in closer. Hey! Kicked out with my left foot, striking with the instep. Dr. Savage gasped. His head snapped back. He groaned and fell on me. Glendon came rushing over. I let the doctor drop and hooked him with my right foot. His mouth opened in surprise. I shut it with an ankle kick. Got both legs around him and squeezed until his eyes bulged. Cut me loose, Clendon, or I'll kick you. He looked at the inert Dr. Savage on the floor and believed me. My hands were still palsied when Glendon cut them free, but I gave him a wrist, palm, heel, and sword peak hand anyway. He went down like a sack. Ernie, the husky guard, walked in carrying another of those wicked little shot glasses. When he saw Glendon and the doctor on the floor, he came charging. I waited and timed it with a perfect high kick, catching him flush on the jaw with the ball of my foot. He buckled forward. I gave him the inverted fist strike to the spleen. He turned green, and I toppled him like a tree with a chop. I got to my feet, leaned over, and pulled Glendon up. Where's Pam Clayton? I don't know. She isn't here. We let her go. What's it all about? Why hold her and cover up her appointment? It wasn't my idea. I had to. Who's behind it? Who gave you the orders? Now don't go away, Glennon. Ernie began to stir. I picked up the little shot glass and shoved it down his throat. He gurgled but swallowed it. I wouldn't have any further worry about him. Then I strapped Glendon onto the slant board. No, please. Please, don't, don't turn it on. And talk. Before I blacked out of my room, I saw a man with you. His name is Dorn. Works for Louis Charnock. Does uh, Dorn have a piece of your action here? No, 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 no. Uh, he, he was here for uh, uh, he, he was here for a rubdown. Come off it. You admitted snatching Pam Clayton wasn't your idea. Now, who are you fronting for? Whose idea was it? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Dorn suggested. I, he didn't explain his plan to me. I, I had to do it. Why? You've got yourself a good thing here. How come you take orders from Charnock and Dorn? They got something on you, is that it? Either you cooperate or they blow the whistle on you, something like that? Please! Or is it a, a blackmail ring? Your rich patrons, their hang-ups, booze, drugs, sex. As director here, you know all the dirt. And their financial ratings, too. Well, are you going to talk? Uh, Dorn, uh, uh, Mr. Dorn... You're saying Dorn. You mean Charnock, don't you? Please, let me up. Maybe I'll just plug you in for a while, loosen you up. No! No, there is no pain. <laughs> Mr. Roper, I know nothing. You had the Clayton kid doped up. What then? A set of compromising pictures to make her old man cough up a lot of loot? No, no, it, it, it wasn't nothing like that. No, she was she was given sedation to, to keep her quiet, that's all. What did you give her, a shot like you gave me? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I told her that there was a, a personal phone call for her in my office, and uh, while she waited, I gave her a cola with the drug. How did you explain it to her when she came to? Well, uh, we, we had one of our staff handle it. Uh, he told her that, that she had fainted, that there was, you know, some new mysterious virus going around. She believed us, and she left. Well, she hasn't returned yet. Did you know that? Was she driving her own car? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, uh, a green convertible. Now, I assumed that she'd be going straight home. You assume rotten. Pam Clayton wasn't your only client with money. Why was she picked, and why Labor Day? I, I don't know. I don't know. What about Tom Hunter? You're not going to answer, Mr. Glendon? 
All right, let's see. How do you turn this thing on? No, 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 no. He, he, he is inside. He, uh, it's the last room, ground floor number 11. Your teeth are chattering, Glendon. After what you put me through, I ought to just... I'll, I'll tell you. I, I'm going to tell you everything. Now, now, see, Hunter suspected that we had Miss Clayton here. Well, he, he started to take the place apart. We had to jump him. We, we had to quiet him down. You let the girl go. Why not Hunter? Orders. Uh, they were afraid that he had made trouble. Who the hell is this guy Hunter, anyway? I don't know. What did you do to him? Uh, memory block. We were trying to erase his memory. With this keen little machine? No, no. Uh, uh, drugs and hypnosis. Uh, what we call condition regression. Mm. Now you're going to take me to him, Glendon, right now. I unbuckled the straps. Glendon's knees almost caved in as he stood up, but he led me back to my room. I locked him in the closet while I dressed. My bag had been searched, but they overlooked my gun in the false bottom. I nudged Glendon with it. He nodded politely and led me to the room at the far end of the corridor. He unlocked the door and I waved him in. A man was lying on the bed, staring listlessly at the ceiling. He matched the description Joey Zale had given me, except his face was now pale and haggard, eyes rimmed with dark circles. A wide gauze bandage topped his skull. What's under the bandage? A small hole bored in his skull? Electrode implants for altering behavior? No, no, it's nothing like that. He, he, he put up a fight and, and banged his head falling. It was just a, a mild concussion at the worst. And he, he didn't respond to hypnosis at all. There, there are some like that, you know. Tough. So uh, why is he so listless? Narcotics. Uh, he, he's in a steel pool. Now, it's going to wear off in a day or so. I, I, I assure you, he's going to be all right. Mr. Hunter? Mr. Hunter? Maybe you did better than you thought, Glendon. No, no, now see, he, 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 he's coming around. Mm. Who are you? Friend of Willie's, Willie Rich. Willie Rich? Come on, Glendon, help me get him dressed. No, not leaving, not without the kid. Pam Clayton's not here. Take my word for it. I'm Willie Rich's friend, Hunter. I wouldn't... Willie... <laughs> Come on, Hunter, up you go. Pam's probably home by now. You want to see Pam, don't you? Night shift will be coming on. we got to get out of here. Pam. Uh, see Pam. Okay, Glendon, you lead the way. It was a short walk down the hall to the side exit, but it seemed miles burdened by Hunter's confused condition. As we hit the cool night air, Hunter's legs buckled and he went limp. Glendon helped me shove him into my car. I could see he was looking around nervously. Don't worry, Glendon. I'll explain it all to Charnock and Dorn when I catch up with them. You've got a bigger worry. Something you should really be nervous about. Who killed Bonnie Burns? What? No, you're joking. A knife in the back's a bad joke. I found her up at Lake Tahoe. Did they tell you that that was how she would spend her vacation? Dead? Well, I... I you're being I, played for a patsy, Glendon. You can get 10 to 20 as an accessory. Who told you to let Bonnie off? I heard a rustle behind us in the dark shrubbery separating the parking lots. Something whistled, glittered in the night. It thudded heavily close to me. Glenn's mouth opened in a surprised scream that aborted suddenly as he coughed and fell against me. He sagged, pulling my arms down with him, and I couldn't find my gun. I judged the knife on his back to have at least a six-inch blade. Glendon was coughing frothy red bubbles. His dead eyes stared at me accusingly, as if I'd asked him one question too many. You will? Why, Jerry, I'd love to. Uh, great. I'll, I'll see you at 7. Bye-bye. I don't believe it! When you finally get a date with Cleopatra, you better have a special chariot, like the new Ford Grand Torino Brome for 74. For 74 with a bold new front end, opera windows, luxurious interiors with optional split bench seats, deep cut pile carpeting. This Torino's got spirit, looks, and it's built solid. What more could you want? Hi, Jerry. I'm glad you called. Yeah, yeah, me too. Riding down the road in style, smooth and quiet, by the mile. The Zero Hour continues after this. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash, and I've been around this great country of ours enough to know how important it is to get as much education as you can while you're young. 
If you want to start college or vocational school, this may be your chance. The government wants to give you some money if you have financial need. Can you believe that? Well, it's true. Look into a new program called Basic Grants to see if you qualify. Hurry on over to the county agent, post office, or nearest school for more information and an application form. A basic grant won't give you all the money you need to make it through college or vocational training, but it'll help you get on the road. It could be the most important road you'll ever walk in your entire life. And if you don't feel like walking, just write your name and address on the back of a postcard and mail it to Basic Grants, Post Office Box 84, Washington, D.C., 20044. That's Basic Grants, Post Office Box 84, Washington, D.C., 20044. Allie Regal opened his door, then followed me down his driveway and helped me carry Tom Hunter into his house. We bedded him down on the living room couch. Turning to leave, I knocked a magazine of local coming events off the coffee table. A lucky accident. It told me Charnock was in San Diego, a ten-minute ride away. I had questions for Charnock about Hunter. It took me longer than I'd expected to get to the theater. The lobby lights were out, cars were driving away. I stopped my car abruptly. Louis Charnock was getting into his long black car. Dorn wasn't with him. The car took off down the Embarcadero north along the riverfront. There were plenty of hotels in San Diego, but Charnock was heading out of the city. I tailed him up Highway 101. The limo swung off the causeway where a curving ramp led to a sumptuous bayside motor hotel, the Bahia Bay. He pulled into a parking stall at the far end, fronting a dark bungalow. I stopped, doused my lights, watched Charnock get out, say goodnight to his chauffeur and go inside. The chauffeur lit a toque, leaned back against his seat and enjoyed the quiet night. His hand, holding the butt, dangled outside the open car window when I came up. I slammed his wrist to the side of the car, leaned in with a solid left, smashing his nose, aborting his outcry. I slugged him again, yanked the door open, and he was out cold. One thing about the bloodletting business, it never hurts to catch a sucker off guard. I removed his belt, lashed his hands together with it, dumped him over into the back seat. Charnock opened his bungalow door to my knock. When he saw my gun, he backed up fast, and I shut the door behind me, locking it. I had a lot of questions to ask you the last time we met. We never got to them. Now I have several more. Uh, let's start with George Glendon. What's your connection with him? George who? Glendon. Glendon. Try harder. He runs the spa at Poway, the Gilded Cuckoo. He seems to be running errands for you, too. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Roper, isn't it? I don't know Glendon or what you're talking about. How about Pam Clayton? Does that ring a bell? I know Monica Clayton, but then we've known each other for years. This gun can go off, you know. I was given a pretty good going over at the Gilded Cuckoo by the same Mr. Glendon I mentioned, so don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about because I've heard differently. Also, while I was getting that going over, I happened to see your friend Dorn. Well, that's quite possible. Mr. Dorn might have some interest there. He has many outside interests. None of them concern me. Let's try some other names. Bonnie Burns, Tom Hunter. I'm sorry, I don't know them. Does Dorn? I suggest you ask him. I will when I get to him. But Dorn works for you and you're the boss as far as I'm concerned. Pam Clayton was abducted, so was Hunter. Bonnie Burns was killed, and now Glendon's got a knife in his hand. I find all that very distressing, but I don't know any of these people. I'm a private investigator, Charnock. On Labor Day, a friend of mine, Willie Rich, was drowned in his swimming pool. I don't think it was his idea. Somehow, I think you're involved. Tyler Clayton's daughter disappeared the same day. Monica Clayton asked me to find her. She had an appointment at the beauty spa. Glendon told me she never got there, but admitted later to keeping her a prisoner. Said that he was acting on orders of higher-ups and implicated you and Dorn. I personally saw Monica Clayton at the theater with you the following day. She didn't come to see me. She came to see Dawn. Why? I imagined to bring him some money. Blackmail? It's been going on for a long time. It's not quite like you think. Mr. Dawn uses me for a front. I happen to be the convenience. Perhaps I can explain our relationship. As he explained it, I had the feeling that Charnock felt relieved to finally be able to tell someone. It seemed that 25 years ago, he had committed an indiscretion with a minor, male, good for a morals rap. Wesley Dorn, a sharp and conniving lawyer, got the evidence and found himself in a position to put an end to young Charnock's platform career. But he was shrewd enough to sense a better arrangement, a partnership, with him calling the shots for Charnock. I was a success from the start. Women gave me money, large amounts, remembered me in their wills, gave me real estate, businesses, insurance policies. It was incredible, really. 
And you never got a dime out of it? You might say just living expenses. Dawn has power of attorney over me. Yeah, you could have got out. Dorn didn't make you write books about what you do. You could have come up with a sore throat or something at your lectures. You don't sound like a president of me. Oh, don't misunderstand, please. I believe in my messages, my books, my lectures. Like it or not, Dorn has made it possible for me to continue my work. Despite his hold on me, I sincerely believe I've helped many people. Mm. You told me Monica Clayton's paying off Dorn, too. What's he got on her? Some porno films from a long time ago. She bought them back and found out Dorn reproduced the negatives. Mm. You sat her on the hook all these years? Yes. Monica has been rather careless at different stages of her life. She's picked up some bad habits. I have nothing to fear from you, Mr. Roper. Apparently, Wesley Dorn has. Where is Dorn now? He has a houseboat in the cove, a short distance off the pier. It's called the Sea Serpent. You can't miss it even at night. It's positively unique. After leaving Charnock, I looked into the back of his car to see how his chauffeur was doing. He was gone. I got to the pier, I expected J.J. to be waiting for me. He wasn't. I found a small boat with oars. I made like Captain Bly and headed for a large gray shape with bright lights a hundred yards out of the bay. The sea servant was campy and attractive. The deck was an extended front porch. There were shutters on the windows and potted plants. A front door and living room covered with brilliant red carpeting. Dorn was lying on it. Face up, a lot of it missing above the eyes. I was a little disappointed, but not too surprised. Two bullets had pinpointed in his forehead, putting an end to this stage of the investigation, not to mention Dorn. Well, one less suspect, one more corpse. Now is the time for another one of my failings. <laughs> no such luck. I was right back where I started. Nowhere. You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful forest where everything was all lovely and green and peaceful. Sunlight fell in ribbons of daylight through its trees. Birds flew in the quiet air above it. Deer and rabbits found secret hiding places to play. For it was truly a beautiful place. And then one day, into this beautiful emerald forest, a new creature came. A creature called Man. And man brought with him fire to warm him against the night. Only with his fire, man did not bring caution, and the fire got away from him suddenly. And the beautiful forest was no more. And yet there might easily be a different ending. For if man is careful with his fire, he need never say, once upon a time, there was a beautiful forest. Heroin hotline. I've had it. I've really had it. Tonight, three of them jumped us. Got my purse. Tore the wedding band off my finger. My husband, he'd hand over his money. why they have to beat him up? Nice old lady next door. Just last week, junkies broke in. Took everything she had. Go ahead. I'm listening. Heroin. When they need that stuff, they do anything. It is a pushy you've got to get. Put it around the block like he owns it. Got little kids. No more 10, 11 years old. Look on heroin. Can you describe him? Oh, I know he's all right. Only I don't want more trouble. We don't need to know anything about you. Just Six, the pusher. Call the National Heroin Hotline, 800-368-5363. It's a free call from anywhere in the country. It's run by the federal government. Call Heroin Hotline in Washington, D.C., 800-368-5363. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, The Princess Stakes Murder. I'm Ron Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour. A presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking.
Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here... To The Zero Hour. This is Mutual, your news and sports radio network. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Suspense! Tonight, Eve, starring Nancy Kelly. Right over there, Miss Jeremy, second booth. Thank you. You got five minutes. Hello, Angel. Oh, Frank. Yeah, there, Angel. Take it easy. We, we don't have much time. Oh, but to have to talk to you like this through an iron screen, not even to be able to touch you. When That's I... the way it is, Angel, when a guy's been... Frank. Frank, I know you didn't do it. I know you didn't. Of course I didn't, Angel, but... Just one of those things, circumstantial evidence. Oh, but there must be something. Uh-uh. I was pretty optimistic during the trial because I knew I didn't do it, I guess, but now that I look back on it, they had enough coincidence pieced together to convict a dozen innocent men. Frank. Oh, Frank, how can you be so calm? How can you... There's one thing I want you to know. I want to be sure you didn't believe any of that gossip about my running around with her. Oh, of course she I She was didn't. a star. I was a producer. I needed her for my next picture. Lorna Moore was a big name in pictures, but... You knew I'd been seeing her. I even told you how I'd quarreled with her. Oh, Frank, Frank, I know. Frank, how much more time is there? Two or three more minutes. No, 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 I mean... Oh, November the 16th. Six weeks. Yeah. Frank, I'm going to do something. What can you do, Angel? Don't you realize there's a murderer running around loose? Some man who's free and having fun and going out with girls... I'm going to find them. How could you find them? The police tried for weeks. They didn't try. All they wanted was to convict you. Uh Uh-uh. But it is nice to hear you say it, Angel, because... What? Because it makes me know you really did love me. Oh, Frank. You see, there are things you can face when you're like this you you didn't dare talk about or even think about before. (laughs) I always loved you, Eve. But you were so much younger and and full of ambition. Oh, Frank, don't. I'm sorry, Angel. I wish I could have done things for you. There won't be much left for you now. You know how it is in this business. You spend it as fast as you make it. stop. Please, please stop. Oh, I'm a heel. Forgive me, Angel. But it's wonderful to know how you do feel. Frank. Frank, I'm not going to let this thing happen. There must be something. There must be some clue somewhere. Well, don't you think the police... Something the police didn't know. Something you saw when you were up there and, and didn't tell them. I couldn't have very well told them anything about that when my whole defense was that I hadn't been up there. But there wasn't anything, nothing important. Oh, but there must have been something. Whoever, whoever was there before you, wh- whoever did it, must have left some trace. Well, there was her address book. Her, her... Yeah, uh, I stuck it in my pocket because, well, it, it was open at the letter J and my name was in it. It was a silly thing to do, but it's in the little secret drawer in my desk. Oh. Frank, why didn't you tell somebody sooner? What was the use? If I told him I'd been up there... Oh, yes. There there, there was another little thing. I, I hadn't thought... Frank, A what, smell. What, a what, what, what kind Cigar of... Cigar smoke. Your time's up, Mrs. Jeremy. Frank, all right. I'll write every day. All right, Mrs. Jeremy. Goodbye. So long, Angel. <laughs> A 
October 5th. Frank, darling, I found the little address book where you said it was. It's not much to go on. There are hundreds of names. But under the J's, there are only three others besides yours. I'm going after them one at a time. Tomorrow, I'm going down to see Lieutenant Trout of the Homicide Bureau. He always seemed to me one of the few who tried to be fair. And I might need help. Oh, darling, I know it isn't much, but you must keep on hoping. Something will happen if only because I love you so desperately. What's your angle, Mrs. Jeremy? M my angle? Yeah. Why are you doing all this? But, but he's my husband. And I love oh, him. Oh, look, Mrs. Jeremy, the cops around this town aren't exactly dummies, you know. We know what you were like before you married. All right, Dick Tracy. A person can change, can't they? Oh, sure they can. A cop just hates to have anyone think they can make a sucker out of him. You know how it is. Well, you can skip the apologies if that's where they're supposed to be. Sure. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, what kind of evidence would I have to have? How specific would what, it have... What, to uh, upset a first-degree murder rap? Well, something in writing. Well, that's not so easy. Have you got a suspect in mind? Some particular person? No, not yet. But you might have. Well, there's one other thing. It's an old, old trick, but it's still good. What's that? Uh, did you ever see one of these things? No, I don't think so. Here, talk into this little gadget here. Well, what, what'll I say? Oh, anything. Just talk. <sighs> Lieutenant Trout is one of the most chivalrous gentlemen I've ever met. <laughs> You're quite a realist, aren't you? <laughs> here, now listen. Lieutenant Trout is one of the most chivalrous gentlemen I've ever met. See? A, a dictaphone. Yeah. Think it might come in handy? Well, it it might. October 7th. Darling, Trout has installed a dictaphone in my new apartment. It's only a room, really. And, of course, I've changed my name to Evelyn Jarvis and my appearance. I don't think that even you, my darling, would recognize me now. The phone numbers are a dead end so far. The first was a dressmaker, and the next a man who's definitely been in the South Pacific for over a year. But there's one more, a Jerry Jordan. I'm going to call him this afternoon. Oh, my darling, I miss you. I miss you so terribly. Hello? Oh, uh... Is this Mr. Jerry Jordan? Yes. <laughs> well, I finally found you. Can you guess who this is? Well, I'm afraid I'm not very good at that. Oh, all right. I suppose I'll have to tell you. This is uh, Evelyn Jarvis. Oh? Well, don't you know who I am? No, I'm sorry. I don't, Miss Jarvis. Well, this is embarrassing. Didn't you get the letter? No. What letter? Oh, my goodness. Well, you see, a, a very good friend of yours, who's also a very good friend of mine, wrote you a letter about me. Or at least he said he would. I see. And I'll give you one other clue. I'm, uh, I'm from out of town. Now can you guess? You wouldn't be from San Francisco, would you? Well... Uh... <laughs> Ed Thornton, eh? <laughs> He always did have a terrible memory for anything but phone numbers. <laughs> well, I, I didn't mean to bother you, but Ed said to be sure and look you up. Well, uh, where are you staying? Oh, I managed to find a little place. Well, lucky you. Uh, have you got any plans for dinner? Why, uh, well, I, I hadn't really thought... Say, better still, have you got any plans for right now? <laughs> well, really, Mr. No, Jordan. no, seriously. By the time we've had a drink and gotten acquainted, you'll be ready for dinner anyway. Oh, no, no. Ah, I... now you wouldn't want Ed Thornton to know you were acting that way, would you? You just jump in a taxi and tell him to take you to the Brown Derby on Vine Street. I'll be waiting right there. Uh, well, And, I... uh, knowing Ed the way I do, I, I'm dying to meet you. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, from what I know, I'm sort of anxious to meet you. <laughs> Just a quick P.S. I'm going to meet him now at 
the Brown Derby. Mr. Jerry Jordan. And I have a hunch he's it. I don't know why. I'll remember what you said about cigar smoke. And yet, although I've got a hunch, it, it makes me feel a little shaky to be going there. He's... Well, he's got such a nice voice to be a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what he says about me, eh? He's a fine pal. <laughs> I'll say one thing for Ed. He may be an awful liar, but he sure has swell taste. Well, which proves he's no liar. <laughs> but tell me, Jerry, is this the Brown Derby? I, I mean, the one you hear about? Uh, this is it. Well, are there any people, you know, famous people here now? Well, it's a little early, but... <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've always thought it was awfully silly, really, to be impressed by movie stars. Still, Hollywood must be sort of an exciting town to live in. I, hmm? I mean, from some of the things I hear that, that oh, go oh, on. Oh, <laughs> that's mostly newspaper talk. Hollywood's just like any other town. They have their regular quota of divorces and fistfights. Oh, and, and murders. Oh. You mean that Lorna Moore business? <laughs> well, I, I read something about it. Yes, that, uh, that was a genuine tragedy, all right. I don't... I don't suppose you knew her. Well, as a matter of fact, Lorna was one of the few celebrities I did know. Oh, really? What was she like? Well, Lorna was a long ways from being the sweet little thing she seemed to be on the screen. Oh, but murder would... Yes, I suppose nothing really excuses that. Well, anyway, they, they got the man who did it. Frank Jeremy? Yes, I guess they did. Y you mean you don't think that... Oh, the case looked good enough. You can't always tell about those things, though. Any number of people might have done it. I, I'm afraid little Lorna's life was kind of a mess. Well, Jerry, were you... Mixed up with Lorna? <laughs> no, oh, no. But, but didn't the police... I, I mean, I should think with a woman like that, all of her friends... They nabbed Jeremy so quick, they didn't even question anyone else. Anyway, I was out of town when it happened. Oh. Uh, Jerry, may I have a cigarette? I'm sorry. I, I don't use them. I, I'll get you some, however... I only smoke cigars. Uh, what, what did you what did you say? I said, I only smoke cigars. Darling, don't you see? His name in her book, and he admits he knew her in the cigars. I'm positive. Now if I can win his confidence, get him up to my apartment near that dictaphone. Oh, I know I can do it. We've still got four weeks, darling, and, and I'll have to be awfully careful. He's clever and, and he's intelligent. Imagine a man who can carry a thing like that on his conscience and, and still be so, so terribly nice and, and courteous and, and thoughtful. But I'm going to win for you, darling. Hello, Jerry. Hello. You been waiting long? Not very. Jerry... Is something the matter? I don't know, darling. Look, why do we always have to meet here? Why can't I pick you up at your place? I don't even know where it is. Sometimes it's almost as though you were, well, keeping some sort of a secret from me. Oh, isn't it a woman's privilege to have secrets? Don't talk like that, darling. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, you, you must know by now I, I couldn't have any secrets from you. <laughs> oh, I'm a fine one to talk, I guess. The fact is I've been holding out on you, darling. I don't live in that hotel. I live in a place out in Beverly Hills with about 30 rooms and a swimming pool a block long. I've got more money than I know what to do with. Oh? Oh, darling, I... I feel like a dog about it now, but I... I didn't want you to know at first. Oh, until you were sure I didn't care about money. Is that it? Yes, dear. Try to forgive me, will you? <laughs> oh, my poor darling. Will you? Of course I will. I do. And, and Jerry? Yes? About those secrets of mine. Suppose there were some things I couldn't tell you yet. Would that matter? Not if I was sure you would tell me someday. Jerry, I promise you that someday I will tell you. Frank, darling. I know the delay must be torture to you, but you must understand how careful I've got to be. I've got to have the positive, living truth on that dictaphone. I 
haven't been able to get him up here yet, but we've still got ten days, and I have a feeling it's going to be soon. Very soon. So don't worry, darling. I miss you. Who is this? Sorry, Jerry. Oh, w wait a minute. Oh, Jerry. Darling, I had to. It, it's been almost a week, and I... Well, how did you find this place? Why do you think I didn't tell you where it was if I didn't have reasons? Let me in, please. I've got to talk to you. I... All right. Darling, Ed Thornton arrived in town last night. Oh. He came to see me. Oh? He's never heard of you. He doesn't know anybody by the name of Evelyn Jarvis or anyone that even looks like you. Is that what you came up here to tell me? Darling, darling, I don't care what it is. Only please, please. Jerry. Jerry. Oh, darling. I want you so much. Oh, Jerry. Jerry, my darling. I want you to go away with me tonight. I want you to marry me. You... You what? I want you to marry me. But first... Oh, my darling, I've waited so long. There's something... Something I've got to tell you. No, Jerry. No, Jerry, don't. I've got to. And then you can tell me whatever it is. And we can start even. If you still want to. Jerry, do we of us have to tell anything? Does that matter now? I've got to, Evelyn. I, I can't keep it any longer. Not the way I feel about, about you. Jerry. I've... I've killed someone. I'm a murderer. Who? Lorna Moore. And another man is going to die for it. <laughs> Jerry. Oh, no, my Jerry. Listen to me. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you've done. Jerry, I love you. You know that I love you. Can you still... I've loved you from the beginning. It didn't matter then and it doesn't matter now. Darling, what do you mean it didn't matter then? Did you... Yes, I knew. You know who I am? Who? I'm Eve Jeremy, the wife of the man who's going to die for it. His wife? Yes. Now you know. And you're willing to let him die? Oh, he deserves to die for the things he's done. He'd have probably killed her anyway I if you he hadn't. I knew seeing her. He was a beast, Jerry. I knew from the beginning it was a mistake. He beat me. He beat me and he tortured me. I, I can't even tell you some of the things he... When... When does it happen? The 16th. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Does that matter to you? I'd let 50 men die to get you, darling. That's why I haven't seen you. That's why I haven't seen you. I was waiting until... We could be in Argentina tomorrow night. I'll pack. I can get plane tickets tonight from a friend. I don't have to change, do I? Oh, you look lovely. I'll, I'll just throw a couple of things in a bag. Nobody will know about this place anyway. Make it quick, though. And it's a perfectly logical time for me to go away for a while. Hurry, baby, hurry. I'm all ready now. How do I look? Oh, you look beautiful, darling. Oh, wait. What? Oh, I ought to write a note to him. Your husband? Yes. Just to keep us both in the clear. He won't get it until just before... What are you going to say? Well, you can read it if you want to. No, no. Here, I'll mail it for you. No, I'll just stick it in my handbag. I'll mail it at the airport. Are you ready? Yes. Come on, Jerry. Well, good evening, Mrs. Jeremy. Uh, oh, hello. You, uh, taking a little trip? Wouldn't you if you were me? Sure, I know how you feel. You, uh, in a hurry? Sort of. My, my friend here was going to run me down to the airport. Lieutenant Trout, Mr. Jordan. Well, I won't keep you but a minute, and then I'll give you a fast trip down there in a squad car. Want to step inside a minute? All right. Your, uh, friend here know what you've been doing? In, in a way. Hmm. Any luck with our little gadget? What little gadget? Oh, a, a, a dictaphone. Lieutenant Trout thought... Oh, you thought, Mrs. Jeremy. All right. I thought. Mind if I turn it on? No, go ahead. There's nothing. I've got to, Evelyn. <gasps> hmm. oh. I can't keep it any longer. Not the way I feel now about you. Oh, Jerry, don't I? I've killed someone. I'm a murderer. Who? Lorna Moore. And another man is going to die for it. <laughs> well... 
Guess that's about all we need to know, isn't it? I guess it is. Well, I told you I'd get him, didn't I? Yeah. Evelyn. You can wrap them up and take them away, Lieutenant. And don't forget to send me back my husband the first thing in the morning. Come on, Jordan. Eve. So long, sucker. Eve. Hm. They sure gave you the right name, baby. Yeah. Only you wouldn't have needed the apple. Or the snake. <laughs> <laughs> It just doesn't seem possible. Back here in our own home, out here on our own terrace again, everything just the way it was. Yeah. Do you remember, do you remember when we first took the place, how happy we were, and, and how the agent took us out on this terrace and asked us if it would be <laughs> too high up, if, if we were afraid of high places? Mm-hmm. Frank, is something bothering you? Well, Eve... Oh, tell me, darling. Oh, I know you've been through so much. When I think that today you might have... Now, look, Angel, I haven't had a kick coming. You, you saved my life. Oh, darling. And I know what the answer is anyway, but it would only prey on my mind if I didn't talk to you about it. And there shouldn't be anything like that between us ever, should there? Well, of course not, darling. What is it? I... I have a record here. What record? That the police took off your dictaphone. Oh, well, Frank, I want to play I... it back for you, Angel. I'll put it on the phonograph here oh, but, on the terrace. Oh, but Frank, please, dear, it's all I... right, Angel, I know. <laughs> Jerry, oh, my Jerry, listen to me. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you've done. Jerry, I love you. Do you know that? I love you. Can you still? I've loved you from the beginning. It didn't matter then, and it doesn't matter now. Darling, what do you mean? matter then. Did you... Yes, I knew. You know who I am? Who? I'm Eve Jeremy, the wife of the man who's going to die for it. His wife? Yes. Now you know. And you're... Is... Is that all? That was the end of the record. That was all that was recorded. <laughs> oh, it's all Frank. right, Angel. It's all right. <laughs> I, I know. Frank, don't you see I had to play it that way? Don't you see I had to make him think that's so I could save you? Sure, I know, Angel. I just wanted to hear you say it, I guess. Please, Angel, I understand. Do, do, do you really? Why, of course I do. I'm a heel, Angel. Oh, darling. Listen, it's all over now. I'll tell you, let's celebrate. All right, let's. I'll go down and get us some wine, champagne or something. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I'll go now, only... <laughs> what, darling? Well, just getting out of the clink, I don't have any money. Do you? Oh, of course, darling. Right there in my handbag. Where? Oh. Oh, sure. Sure, you've got plenty. Say, here's a letter. A, a letter? Yeah, and it's addressed to me. A letter? A, a, a letter? Oh, Frank. Well, you must Frank, have forgotten don't. to... Frank. No, Frank. No, no Frank, no. No, Frank, I, I didn't. I, I, I can explain just how, Frank, I... Please, Frank... Angel! Trout. Trout, this is Frank Jeremy. A terrible thing has just happened. What? My wife. Suicide. Nerves, I guess. She jumped off the terrace before I could stop her. It's 14 stories. Was suicide, was it? She gave me a note in her own handwriting just before. Oh. Well, of course, if the note says so. It does, all right. Hmm. Well, the case is closed. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. It says... Frank, my darling, I've been wrong all the time. I've failed you utterly. Now I can't even bear the thought of facing you. When you read this, I will be gone. 
this is farewell forever. Signed, Eve. And so closes Eve, starring Nancy Kelly. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. And now, further to intrigue you, we of Suspense present a special preview of our next exciting tale. And here it is, a tantalizing glimpse of our next adventure in Suspense. Warden Graves. Yes, Miss Rhodes. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I hate to disturb you like this, but I've traveled clear across the country. They wouldn't give me the information over the phone. I know. You know what this visit is all about, Warden. To some extent, yes. You think one of our prisoners, Tom Nixon, has escaped. He has escaped. I'm as sure of it as, as I'm sure of sitting here now. I saw him at large in New York City two days ago. You knew Tom Nixon well, Miss Rhodes? Knew him? He was my mother's murderer. My mother was Mrs. George Rhodes of Huntington, Long Island. She ran a boarding house there. He killed her on September 18th, 1933. We have all the records of the crime, Miss Rhodes. Tom was mother's chief boarder for ten years. <sighs> know him. Why, I sat opposite him at dinner table from the time I was a girl of 15. I knew him as well as I knew mother. I'd, I'd know him anyway. I see. And now he's at large. He's free. Somehow or other, he's, he's escaped this place. Maybe you're not aware of it. Maybe even his fellow prisoners aren't aware of it. But he's wormed his way out. And he's after me. He's after oh, me. Oh, now, my dear young lady. Warden Graves. Ten years ago, when mother was found murdered, I knew it couldn't have been anyone but Tom. I testified against him. I was the chief, practically the only witness at the trial. And when they sentenced him here for life, he swore to kill me. He swore in the open court to get even with me. For ten years, I've lived in deadly fear. I've watched the newspapers for prison breaks. I've moved from house to house, made few friends. He's hung over me like a shadow. Even though I told myself he was locked up here, locked up here forever. And now it, it's come. And where exactly did you see the prisoner, Miss Rose? There's just the point. That's why I know he's after me. I saw him in my own apartment house. Well. He has a job there, running the elevator at night. That's what makes it so horrible. I've never married Warden Graves. I live all alone in a small three-room penthouse on the 18th floor of an office building. The other night, about a week ago, I came home alone from the movies. After midnight, the big marble lobby of my building was deserted. Except in a far corner near the elevator, with his back toward me, there was a man, down on his hands and knees, scrubbing the floor. Good evening. Evening. Well, where is everybody? Isn't the elevator working tonight? You want to go up in the elevator, Mum? Certainly. I'll be right with you. Okay, Mum. What floor? I was in the elevator. And we had started to ascend before I really saw him. It was Tom. His hair had turned white. And there was a horrible stoop to his shoulders. But everything about him, the crook of his head, his high, thin, bony nose, the hollow cheekbones were all the same. And then he turned and stared at me. I could see those deadly, pale, cold eyes. Those heavy eyebrows, still black. That familiar, quiet, sarcastic mouth. What floor, Mum? Oh, oh. my floor. Uh, yes, the penthouse, please. Penthouse? Where's that, on the roof? Yes, on the roof, please. 18th floor. Okay. Warden Graves. It was being like, it was like being in a cage with a wild beast. He kept watching me, peering at me furtively as the elevator moved with agonizing slowness up and up past the floors. I shrunk back, averting my face. The light in the car was dim. My only hope was that he did not recognize me. Here's your floor, miss. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. You can go back down. I, I don't need anything, thank you. What's the matter? 
Forgotten your door key? No. No, it's just... It's right in my bag. I'll find it in a minute. You want me to let you in? Let me in? No. No, good Lord. I got pass keys to all the doors. No trouble. No, thanks, but I... No, no. No, I, I have it right here. Good night. <laughs> And so until our next performance, when you will hear the rest of this exciting tale, we keep you in... Suspense! You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Ray Theater. that you've become a regular visitor. And since you're such a good customer, it's only fair to warn you that the story you're about to hear may be a little bit more disturbing than most. If the sounds of a woman screaming in utter terror unnerve you, then perhaps you may not want to listen to a tale called Where Fear Begins. It's a story about exactly that, fear. But perhaps the best way to find out is to hear what happens to Amanda Shepard on a dark night when moonlight streams through her window. But not just moonlight. Our mystery drama, Where Fear Begins, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slusser and stars Kim Hunter. The night is still and peaceful in the small town known as Manassa Valley. Most nights are peaceful here. And one person who enjoys that stillness is Miss Amanda Shepard. The big city is only 50 miles away, but for Amanda, it might as well be 50,000. But there are many ways to shorten distances. And tonight, something is going to happen that will destroy the peace and stillness of Amanda Shepard's life. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, hello. Amanda. Amanda, is that you? Uh, yes. Who, who is this? It's Vera. Vera? Oh, for heaven's sake, what's the matter with you? Don't you know what time it is? What are you talking about? Where are you? Amanda, Amanda, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm so frightened. You've got to help me. Listen, are you drunk? You've got to come out here. You, you, you've got to stay with me. Vera, will you please make some sense? It, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm 50 miles away. Well, Oh, for heaven's sake, Vera, I've got a class to teach tomorrow. Come to think of it, it's even worse than that. I have a faculty meeting. Amanda, don't you, don't you, don't you understand? I need you. Don't make me explain. Just come. <sighs> All right. Look, I can't promise when I'll be there exactly. Where are you staying? Vera? Vera, what's the address? Did you hear me? Vera, are you still there? <laughs> Vera! Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. What can I get you? Uh, nothing, thanks. I was looking for the manager. So are his creditors. Well, 
Oh, maybe you can help me. Have you worked here long? Truth is, I don't work here now. I'm what you might call a guest bartender. Oh, I see. Tell me anyway. Well, I'm trying to find someone. I, I know she no longer works here. She told me she quit her job about two months ago, but it, it's the last bit of information I have about her. Now, who is her, exactly? Her name is Vera Shepard. Do you know her by any chance? Nope, I can't say I do. She called me last night and sounded as if she was in trouble. I was tempted to call the police, but knowing Vera could just be some of her melodramatics. Well, thank you anyway. It's okay. Hey, wait a minute. Yes? This Vera Shepard, is she blonde and pretty about your height? Yes. There's a girl I met in an encounter group last month. Her last name was Shepard, but her first name was Roxanne. Roxanne? Well, that could be her. She always hated the name Vera. She was always threatening to change it. Look, have, have you any idea where she might be living? Sure. She lives with me. What? <laughs> in the same rooming house. Upstairs. In indescribable squalor, I might add. What's a nice lady like you doing with a friend like Roxy? She's my sister. Ouch. Well, excuse me, I think I'll go see if I can pry my foot out of my mouth. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, where's this squalid rooming house of yours? Number 9 Hudson Street, near the river. If you see a bum sleeping in the doorway, that's the place. Hey, you weren't thinking of going there now. Of course. It's not a good idea. Now, you can't go into a neighborhood like that looking the way you do. What's the wrong with the way I look? Wait a minute. My friend Tony will be back here in five minutes to take over the bar. I'll go with you. Well, I'm sure I can find it alone. There's some pretty bad customers around there. Well, they don't look any better here. You can trust me. Underneath this dirty shirt beats a heart of pure soap. Well, all right. Careful of those stairs. They're in bad shape. Ugh, how can people live in a place like this? Nobody lives here. We exist on another plane. Our bodies may wallow in filth, but our souls live in penthouses. Is that what you learned in your encounter, Cruz? <laughs> well, here's her door. The grand portal of the Princess Roxanne. She has a radio on. I hope that isn't all she has on. Princess is a little hard of hearing. She must be home. Let me try. Vera? Vera, are you in there? Might be asleep or stoned. Maybe she just went out and left the radio on. Look, I'm terribly worried about her. She really sounded dreadful. She said she was frightened about something. I could always break the door in. It's pretty flimsy. Do you think we should? Just say the word. All right. Please. That's the word. By the way, what did you say your name was? Uh, Amanda Shepard. My name is Kirk Davies. Pleased to meet you. Ah. Yeah, that was easy. Come on in. Ooh, what an awful place. I told you, indescribable squalor. A beggar must be in here. There? There, it's me. It's Amanda. Oh, my... Vera! Oh, it? my God! Is, it, is she sick? Look at her. Look at her eyes. Take it easy, take it easy. I, I, I don't think she's breathing. <laughs> she's dead. Oh, my God, my poor sister is dead. <laughs> Shepard, if you think you can talk about it now, let's get a few of the facts straight. There's only one thing you have to get straight, Lieutenant Derrier. Somebody did this to my sister. Yeah, you told me. Uh, how long were you two separated? A little over a year. She left Manassa Valley about 14 months ago. Well, what for? Just to come to the big city? I suppose that was her reason. Any other reason you know about? Was there a man, for instance? There was a man, all right, but not what you're thinking. Vera had a fight with our father. Your father lived in Manassa Valley? Yes, my sister and I never got along very well with him. Uh, the both of you? Yes, both of us. But then Vera had this fight with him, and she packed her bags and left. She had some idea of becoming an actress or a singer or something like that. I, did she? No. I don't know what she became here. 
And uh, when she called you last night, what did she say exactly? She just said she was scared. Scared out of her wits. And I heard this terrible scream. Lieutenant, there's only one explanation. Somebody was after her. Somebody was in her apartment last night and killed her. I'm sorry, Miss Shepard, but uh, this is no murder case. But you saw her eyes. You saw the way she looked as if she'd been frightened to death. There's just no such thing, Miss Shepard. At least not on the law books. Your sister suffered a cardiac arrest. That's a heart attack. I can't believe that. That look on her face. It was just a death agony. That's all you saw. Somebody was after her. Some man, probably. I'm sure of it. Maybe she was scared because she was sick. There was nothing wrong with her health. Look, the medical examiner knows this business, miss. Of course, if you want to insist on an autopsy, that's your privilege. An autopsy? That means cutting her open. That's what it means. And if it proved you were wrong? That she didn't die of natural causes? Oh, we'd be the first to admit it. All right, then. I want an autopsy. Look, I'm sure that something horrible happened to Vera. Okay, whatever you say, Miss Shepard. I'll be in touch with you. Oh, uh, where will you be staying? I'll be staying right here. I just don't see how you can live in that place. Well, the rent's been paid until the end of the month. There's no reason I should stay anywhere else. I thought you had a job in Manassa Falls. Manassa Valley. I do have a job. I teach school. I've already asked for a leave of absence. I, look, I'm not leaving here until the police do something about this. You may have a long wait. It doesn't matter how long. I know something happened to my sister, and nobody seems to care. Listen, I'll be taking care of the bar for another couple of hours. Why don't I meet you later for a drink or something? No, I, I, I have to get home. I have to call my father, and I have to get some sleep. I'm so dreadfully tired. Okay, but if you need a friend... Remember, I live one floor away. Yes, I remember. Dad, there was no way I could make the funeral arrangements yet. Why not? Because the police are performing an autopsy on Vera's body to determine the exact cause of death. What? I thought you told me she had a heart attack. Yes, but I still thought it'd be wise to learn more about it. Dad, she was only 26 years old. Yeah, but she wasn't a well girl, Amanda. You know that. She had rheumatic fever when she was a child. It all seemed perfectly well to me. Look, Dad, I'm just not satisfied about this. That's all there is to it. That's why I'm not coming home until I find out more. You're a stubborn woman, Amanda. You're just as stubborn as your mother was. All right, Dad. I'll try to speak to you again tomorrow. What's the hurry? You you haven't talked three minutes with yet. I'm exhausted. I've got to get some sleep. Goodbye, Dad. (sighs) How can I sleep? How can I? I know I'm just going to lie awake all night. Just thinking about Vera... Oh, Lord, why did I decide to stay in this horrible place? I have to clean it up tomorrow. It's so filthy. At least that'll give me something to do. Oh, if only I could sleep. I wonder if Vera has anything in the medicine cabinet. It won't hurt to look. Yeah, what a mess of bottles. Half of them are empty. What's this one? Aspirin. Wait a minute. This one's marked. For sleep. Thank God. It's the only way I'll get to close my eyes tonight. It sounds like 
There's someone at the door. At the front door. Well, uh, 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 one minute. Uh, all right, all right, I'm coming. I can just find my slippers. Uh, who is it? Uh, oh, my God. Oh, my God, who's out there? Who is it? Who, who's out there? Go away! Go away, whoever you are, go away! The door! The lock is broken! It's coming in here! Oh, God, it's coming in! Ah! Oh, dear Lord, help me! Help me, somebody! Ah! Now, that's what I would call an unexpected visitor. Of course, there are neighborhoods in every large city that have their share of gorillas, but they're customarily of the human variety. How did this specimen get to Amanda Shepard's apartment? I'd be glad to tell you, but that would be spoiling the surprises that... Here's the second act of Where Fear Begins. Well, it appears that no harm has come to our friend Amanda Shepard, unless you call a good case of hysteria harm. But now there's another visitor to the apartment, Kurt Davies, who quickly raced up the stairs when he heard her cries for help. I, I, I saw it. I, I saw it. So help me. I saw a gorilla, an ape. I, I don't know what you call it. Sure you saw it, Amanda, but in a dream. I know the difference between a dream and reality. It was a real gorilla. It broke the door in. No, no, honey. I'm the one who busted in the door, remember? And first thing tomorrow, you've got to get a lock on it. Kurt, Kurt, please listen to me. This was real. I know it was. That this animal tried to get in here and kill me. When I started to scream, it went away. Amanda, I didn't see any gorilla coming out of this place. I mean, wouldn't I have seen it too? Well, maybe it's hiding somewhere in the building. Maybe it has a hiding place. This is really crazy. Look, maybe that's what Vera saw. Maybe that's what she was horribly frightened about. Amanda, have you ever searched this apartment? Searched it? What for? Well, maybe you'd find something. Letters, a diary, maybe. Oh, if there are never kept a diary. It's worth a try, isn't it? Come on, let's look right now. I'll help you. Why? Why should you want to help me? Why not? You don't really care what happened to my sister. You hardly knew her. Maybe I didn't want to know her. Why not? What's the point of knocking the dead? No, tell me, please. Why didn't you like Vera? I didn't like Roxanne because she called herself Roxanne when her name was Vera. I didn't like the way she spent her time looking for one kick after the other, even if it meant kicking somebody else in the teeth. Was she really like that? Look, it's late. Maybe maybe you should go back to bed. We'll search the place another time. No, no, no. You're right. You know, I should have done this before. Yeah, I remember seeing something in the bedroom, as a matter of fact. See what? Uh, it looked like an address book. Wait, I'll get it. Maybe it is a diary. A record of all the kicks she got out of life. Uh, no, no. It, it's in a dress book. Not too many names in it. Well, let me see if I'm in it. No, guess I didn't make that much of an impression. Do you recognize anybody's name? Let's see. Well, here's Tony's. That's the place where I work. I thought you were only a guest bartender. That's only temporary. Until my rich uncle in Argentina dies. That is, if I have a rich uncle. Wait a minute. What'd you find? Are you sure your sister was healthy? Well, my father doesn't agree, but I, yeah, I think she was, yes. I mean, I mean, healthy in the head. Ever occur to you that the call she made to you that night was just... Well, that she might have been wigging out? Oh, no. Look, I'm sure Vera wasn't crazy. Well, the reason I ask is she has Dr. Swally's number in her book. Who? Dr. Raymond Swally. I've heard of him. What kind of a doctor is he? I suppose you could call him a shrink, but I think he calls himself a psychologist. If your sister Vera was all that together, would she be seeing someone like that? 
I don't know. How would you like me to see Dr. Swally and ask him? No, the name isn't familiar, I'm afraid. But I won't trust my memory. I have a book that my secretary keeps for me. She might have called herself Roxanne Shepherd. A neat alphabetical book. Miss Regelman tends to be a little compulsive about her record keeping. I'll have to explore her subconscious one of these days. No, there's no one of that name who was my patient. Maybe you knew her personally. Oh, I'm quite sure I didn't. Yeah, but your name was in her address book. She might have heard about me. You mean she might have taken down your name but never called you? Well, that's possible, isn't it? I guess so. How old did you say the girl was? Twenty-six. Hmm. Pity. And the cause of death? They called it cardiac arrest, but her sister doesn't believe it. She insisted that an autopsy be performed. Was it? Yes. And the result? Negative. It was heart failure, all right. Well, then, why isn't the lady satisfied? Because she still thinks that people can die of fright. Pure and simple fright. <laughs> What's the use of my staying any longer, Kurt? I'm just packing up Vera's things and leaving. You want me to help you? No, I'm just taking everything that belonged to her, not even trying to sort it out. Don't forget the stuff in the medicine cabinet. I'll bring it to you. Well, most of the bottles are empty. Uh, so I see, but this one isn't. What's this, Amanda? Sleeping pills. I took one of them last night. Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me see that again. Kurt, look. The label. What about it? It says Dr. Swally. What? You said that Swally denied that Vera was his patient, yet he prescribed these sleeping pills. Are you sure? Well, see for yourself. Well, what do you know? Now, why would he lie about something like that? I don't know. He must be hiding something. And I have to know what it is. Yeah, but how? If he lied to me once, he'll lie again. Uh, what if I went to see him? But I told him about you, about your being Vera's sister. What if I didn't go there as Vera's sister? What if I went as a, a patient? I'm so miserable all the time, Doctor. So depressed and nervous. I, I don't want to wake up in the morning. I want to go right on sleeping. Hibernating from the world. Do you think you can help me? Well, that all depends. How much do you know about my treatment? Well, not really very much. Just that I've heard you've been able to help people. But you must have also heard that my therapy isn't quite orthodox. Well, no, no. I guess I've never heard of that. Oh, don't, don't be alarmed. Basically, I'm a Freudian. I believe in the theory of the subconscious. But I look at it slightly differently. I call the subconscious the dungeon of the human mind, the place where we hide all our guilty fears. The conscious mind tries to forget their existence, but they cry out and rattle their chains and make our lives miserable. Do you understand? I think so. Personally, I believe that fear is the true enemy of mental health. What I try to do for my patients is eliminate fear. We're all afraid of something, aren't we? <laughs> right now, you look as if you're afraid of me. Uh, no, 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 I'm really very interested. It's one thing to know what we fear. Insects, mice, grizzly bears, high places. But many of our fears are so buried in our minds that we forget their existence. Do you ever have nightmares, Miss Lewis? Yes. Uh, in fact, I had one just the other night. I'd... I dreamt that a gorilla tried to break into my apartment. It was, oh, so terribly real. Are you especially afraid of gorillas? I've never even thought about them, not since I was... For heaven's sake. You were about to say, not since you were a child. Yes, when I was a child, only four years old, I'd forgotten all about it. But you remember now. Yes, my, my father took me to the zoo. I, I was having a good time until he brought me to the gorilla cage. And it frightened you? Well, at first I was fascinated. I'd never seen anything like it before. So much like a man and not not a man. So Daddy picked me up so I could get a better look. And it, 
It reached for me. It reached out for me. Oh, God, how could I have forgotten that? I screamed. I screamed at the top of my lungs. And just the other night, you screamed again? Yes. Isn't it incredible? But don't you see what happened? You relived this fearful event of your childhood, what we call a traumatic experience. Now that you've done it, faced it, perhaps you've also uprooted it, along with other repressed fears. Oh, I don't know about that. All I know is I was absolutely terrified. Terrified, yes, but perhaps also purified. Miss Lewis, I'm sure you've heard of LSD, haven't you? LSD? Oh, yes, of course. It's that drug that makes you see hallucinations. No, it isn't the only drug, you know. There's mescaline, psilocybin, and a new derivative of LSD-25, which I've developed, known as EN-30. I don't understand. Well, LSD is the chemical shorthand for lysergic acid and diethylamide. A very small amount can produce hallucinations of every form and variety. EN-30 is rather different. It produces only one kind of hallucinatory affect. The effect of fear. Fear? Some people call it, incorrectly, the horror drug. It's a powerful hallucinogen. Dangerous when used carelessly, but extremely useful under controlled conditions. It goes right to the sub-basement of human consciousness and brings up images from the very place where fear begins, the dungeon of our minds. You, you mean it makes people see the things that they're afraid of? Yes, usually the things which frightened us when we were children. And what makes it dangerous? The fact that we might be uh, scared to death? Oh, scared to death is a highly inexact term. But in certain cases... In, in the case of a... Heart condition. Oh, I would never administer the drug to anyone with such a history. How long does the effect last? Well, varies greatly among individuals, but like LSD, the effect can often be cyclical. That is, the hallucinations can return on a cyclical basis, even if no EN30 has been taken for several days. This is one reason why controlled use is very important. Uh, Dr. Swally, are you giving this drug to all your patients? Oh, no, my dear. Only to a few, and under stricter supervision. And, of course, with their complete understanding and agreement. I see. Yes, I, I really think I understand now, Doctor. Listen, Amanda, do you know what you're saying? You're accusing Swally of being a criminal. That's why he lied to you. He was afraid to admit that Vera was his patient because he gave her this horror pill of his. And she died. Well, you don't know that for sure. I Amanda. don't know it. He says he never gave anyone the pill except under controlled conditions. But he lied. He said he'd never give one of those things to someone with heart trouble, but he gave one to Vera. Look, you're all worn out. You better get to sleep, and we'll talk about it in the morning. I'm going to the police in the morning, Kurt. Will you go with me? Amanda, I've already been to the police. What? I saw Lieutenant Duryea. But why? I've been worried about this undercover game you've been playing. So I talked to Duryea, told him about what you were doing and what you suspected. And? Duryea made a check of Swally's records, Amanda. He made it part of the routine police inquiry into your sister's death. What are you trying to say? Swally wasn't lying about it. What? He wasn't lying about your sister. She was never his patient. The, the, the sleeping pills. They must have belonged to one of your sister's roommates, or maybe she just swiped them from somebody else's house. Did you tell me that Vera was always swiping things? Oh... Kurt, am I wrong? It wasn't his fault. That's the way it looks. If your sister was having nightmares, she was having them on her own. Mm. Oh, it's so warm in here. It's too warm to sleep. I've got to get... Open that window or I'll suffocate. Oh, it's so hard to open. Oh, there. Whew, that's 
should help a little. What was that? Oh, good Lord. Oh, good Lord, something flew in here. It's right in my room. Ah! It's not a bird, it's a bat. It's trying to get in my hair. Ah! It's in my hair. It's all tangled up in my hair. Ah! What is there about a bat which fills almost all of us with dread? Is it the cape-like wings, the rat-like face, the raking claws, the terrifying screech of their voices? Can anyone blame Amanda Shepard for the cry of horror she emits when that winged monster comes flapping into her room? Or was there really a bat? Was it only a creature of her imagination? Amanda Shepard has had another nightmare. A dream so vivid that she lies in her bed this morning in a state of shock. Still unable to believe that the bat which flew into her room the night before isn't still entangled in her hair. It may have been the heat, Amanda. This building is a real hot box when the weather turns warm. Yes. I don't know. Maybe that's all it was. Maybe I had some kind of a heat stroke. You ask me, you ought to get out of this apartment right now. Maybe that's another reason you have bad dreams. This place is depressing you. Yes, you're right. There's no point in my staying here anymore. The police have proved that, haven't they? You just have to accept the truth. Your sister died because... Well, because she died. And I guess that means I, I should go back. Doesn't mean you have to go back to Manassa Valley. Listen, have you ever thought of teaching right here in the city? We've got an awful lot of kids here who... No, Kurt. No, it's time for me to go home. So the whole thing was a waste of time, wasn't it? I suppose so, Dad. I told you you've been stubborn, wasting two weeks on a wild goose chase. Dad, don't you understand? Vera died without either one of us being there. She died all alone, in agony. And whose fault was that? Who told her to leave home? All right. Let's not talk about it anymore. Uh, now you even sound like your mother. Whenever she didn't want to hear the truth, she'd ask me not to talk about it anymore. We've said it all, haven't we? I'm going to bed early. I've been sleeping very badly lately. Amanda, uh, wait. Yes, Dad? Look, why does it have to be this way between us? I don't know what you mean. It's been like this for years, this... This wall of ice between you and me. What put it there? I've asked myself a thousand times and I still don't know the answer. Maybe you'll never know, Dad. Oh, I know it started right after your mother died. That was when you... That was when you turned against me. You and Vera both. Oh, please, Dad. We'll discuss it some other time. I'm, I'm really too tired. Oh, no, you'll never discuss it with me. You'll just go on hating me for the rest of your life. I don't hate I you. I saw the look in your eyes the day your mother died. I saw the way you looked at me, Amanda. I don't remember how I looked at you. How could I? I was in a state of shock. You were in a state, all right. And you've never snapped out of it. Please, Dad. All right, go to bed. There's no use trying to reach you. Never been any use. Hi, handsome. Hey, this is turning into a permanent job for you, isn't it? <laughs> I guess I'm just a natural-born bartender, so uh -oh. what can I get you tonight? Well, how about a Manhattan? Did you learn how to make one of those? <laughs> I'll give it a try. <laughs> hey, uh, how's your blonde friend these days? Which one? I know a half a dozen blondes. Mm, you know the one I mean. The one who looks like a school teacher. She is a school teacher. No kidding. Now, where is she now? Going back to teaching school, I guess. Hey, you really liked her, didn't you? That's what I heard around. I liked her. But she's strictly a small-town girl. 
Is it true that she was Roxy's sister? That's right. It's <laughs> hard to believe, isn't it? That Roxy Shepherd would have a sister like that. <laughs> Hey, hey, did you know that I was her last roommate? What? That's right. I paid half the rent on that filthy pad of hers. I couldn't stand it more than one week. She was stoned all the time, you know. Yeah, I figured she hit the stuff pretty hard. That could overtake anything, as long as there was a kick in it. She even went to some doctor just to get some kind of pill he was handing out. What'd you say? <laughs> she heard about some nutty kind of LSD that a shrink was using on his patient. She told me she was going to see him and get some... Hold it a second. Do you know the shrink's name? No. Was it Swally? Dr. Raymond Swally? Well, how should I know? Well, I've got to know. How many times do I have to tell you I never had a patient by that name? If you don't believe me, ask the police. All right, maybe you never had a patient named Shepard, but maybe she didn't give you her right name, first or last. I'm quite sure you're mistaken about this. I've only administered EN30 treatment to four patients. I can assure you this girl wasn't one of them. Dr. Swally, will you just look at this photograph? Oh, all right. Now, look, does she look at all familiar? Nope. I never treated her. Look, look carefully. It's a professional portrait. She thought she wanted to be an actress, and she's pretty heavily made up. Mm-hmm. Never saw this woman before. Well, I guess I'm wrong. All right, doctor. Sorry I bothered you again. Wait. Just a minute. Something come to you? She does look familiar. She wasn't a patient, but I have seen her before. Where? Right here in my office. She came in without an appointment. That's why there was no record of her. She just sat outside and waited. And did you see her? Just for a few minutes. Just long enough to realize that she wasn't interested in therapy. All she wanted was the drug. EN30. I told her that I wouldn't accept her as a patient, that she wasn't nearly stable enough. I gave her a prescription for a mild sleeping compound, nothing else. But then... Then what? Well, I... I don't know this for certain. Uh, I could be mistaken about it. About what, Doctor? I always suspected that she might have been the one who stole those pills. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that Vera Shepard stole some EN30 from you? I can't prove it. It wasn't until days later that I missed them. I remember stepping out of the room for a few minutes to take a call from a hysterical patient. Dr. Swally, Vera Shepard was a klepto. Her sister told me that she stole things all the time. If she stole those pills of yours... Good Lord. Can it really be? The dosage was so large. Too large for safety. If she took them... Anything might have happened. Something did happen. She had a nightmare, Doctor. She conjured up a nightmare so terrible that it killed her. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. You know that wasn't my intention. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You did say that you gave her a prescription for sleeping pills. Yes, I did. I doubt that she ever filled it. It was the EN30 she really wanted. Then what was in that bottle? What were the pills her sister took? A sister? Dr. Swally, I've got to get to a telephone. Hello? Hello, is Amanda Shepard there? Oh, well, yes, yeah, she's here, but she's asleep right now. Who is this? Is this Mr. Shepard? Oh, that's right. Uh, can I, uh, can I take a message? Mr. Shepard. Well, I'm sorry, but I told you she's fast asleep. Would you know she's taking anything to help her sleep? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I thought I did see her take something. She's very Listen, tired. Mr. Shepard, you've got to get a doctor for her right now. I know it sounds crazy, but if she took a pill that her sister was using, she may be in danger. Well, wait, what, 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 what are you talking wait, about? I'm driving out there, but, but your daughter may be in terrible danger right now. Why? 
I couldn't open the door, Amanda. I have your mother. I have to hold your mother. Oh, God, it is bleeding. She's covered with blood. Go on, Mother Amanda. I said I would kill her one day. And now I've done it. I've killed your mother. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right, darling. It's all right, baby. I'm okay now. Oh, my God. Oh, Daddy. It's just a dream, honey. Just... Just a bad dream. Daddy, Daddy, please hold me. Don't let me go. No, Amanda. Oh. I won't let you go. That's what Dr. Swally told me himself, Amanda. He's discontinuing the use of EN-30. Says it's far too dangerous to take any more chances with. Frankly, I think he's right. Good. Do you know what my suspicion was? What? I saw my father walking into the bedroom, carrying my mother's dead body. Ouch, that must have been pretty grim. Well, the strange part is, it reminded me of something. Something I'd forgotten a long time ago. What was that? When I was a little girl, I used to hear my father and mother arguing downstairs. You're fighting with each other night after night. Well, I was so afraid. That's well, understandable. But do you know what I was afraid of? I was afraid that my father was going to kill my mother. That's an awful thought. Well, it wasn't true, of course, but it was a fear that stayed with me all this time. But now I... You know, I feel as if I can get rid of it. Kurt, I... I know it sounds crazy, but but wouldn't it be something if it turns out that Dr. Swally had the right idea? Well, personally, I don't think I would care very much for that kind of shock treatment. In fact, I think I'd rather have my neurosis and gorillas, bats, and so forth in my house. But to each his own, huh? Our cast included Kim Hunter, Mason Adams, Alan Hewitt, Ian Martin, and Phoebe Doran. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams?
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Ceremonies, Mr. Lorry had to attend a special conclave of the International Association of Witches, Goons, and Creeps, of which he is a charter member. So I am here in his place, opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight, the Mystery Playhouse has been fortunate enough to secure the services of that light-hearted raconteur of murder, horror, and the supernatural, the laughing boy of the inner sanctum, Raymond. Raymond's been telling about the horrible things that happened to other people for a long time now, and getting a huge bang out of it. But tonight, the tables are turned, and he finds himself on the receiving end, which seems like poetic justice indeed. I think it might prove interesting to find out how Raymond's much vaunted sense of humor survives the acid test. So follow me to the home of the squeaking door, little house of a thousand horrors, the inner sanctum. Good evening, friends. This is your host, Raymond. Welcome to the squeaking door of the inner sanctum. For those of you who write in to find out why our door squeaks so much, I guess now is a good time as any to explain that the hinges are rusty with dried blood. Through that door pass the most beautiful ghouls in the world. Won't you come in? <laughs> Well, friends, are you ready? Good. Now remember, if you must scream, do it with your mouth closed so you won't annoy the rest of your family. You know, you don't need dark old houses or murky graveyards to feel the chilly presence of beings from the other world. Uh, last week, just after I completed my broadcast, I was called to the telephone. And I picked up the receiver, I heard. Hello, is that you, Raymond? Yes. Are you going to be at home tonight? Uh, yes, why do you ask? Because I'm going to drop by. Something I want to ask you about. Try to be alone. Uh, who are you? Don't you remember me? Well, the voice is familiar, but I can't quite place it. I'm Gideon Blake. I'll see you later, Ray. Goodbye. Now, there's nothing unusual about a call like that, except one thing. Ten years ago, my friend Gideon Blake was killed. I'm sure that call was some joke. I remember laughing about it as I sat down in my living room with sandwich and glass of milk. But uh, later that night, I must have dozed off. I remember being awakened by the tower clock chiming. It was midnight. Somewhere a cat howled against the moaning wind that had sprung up. Strange chills and a shudder through my body. Front door must have blown open. I went to see. Standing there was... Gideon Blake. Good evening, Raymond. Blake. You shouldn't be so surprised. I told you I was coming. Yes. You've changed so. It's been a long time. More than ten years, I believe. But I... I don't understand. You were burned to death. How on earth did you come back? 
There are many things which you will never understand while you're alive and on this earth. Why have you come here? To give you this piece of paper. Hmm? What's on it? The names of four persons. They are alive now. In a short time, they will all be dead. I looked at him carefully as he talked. He looked hideous, ugly, with horrible burns on his face. The man had the look, touched the very smell of death. Good night, Raymond. I looked at the slip of paper my friend Gideon had given me. There were four names. Stella Marlowe. Robert Lane. Amelia Cardway. Raymond Edward Johnson. The first three names I didn't know. The last was very familiar to me. It was my own name. Oh, hello, Raymond. Sit down. Thanks, Inspector Dawn. Cigars? No, thanks. What about that piece of paper I gave you? How'd you get it? I told you. Look, I'm a cop, Raymond. When I believe a story like that one, you can call the little men in the white coats. Oh. Now I'm sorry I bothered you, Inspector. Let's forget it. <laughs> I can't forget it. Why? Because Blake wrote that note. Are you sure? We checked the handwriting. It's his. So are the fingerprints we found on it. How do you figure it? I don't yet. I am waiting for you I to... I told you everything. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Maybe Blake's really alive. He got burned to death ten years ago. Are you sure? Positive. We checked every angle of his death at that time because we thought he might have been murdered. Murdered? I never heard about that. Oh, Blake was with the department, you remember, working on a homicide case. The Laura Wilcox case, you remember? Oh, uh, vaguely. We figured someone might have polished him off, but nobody did. It was an accident. Was this Wilcox murder ever solved? Well, uh, no. Maybe those names I gave you had something to do with the Wilcox case. Why don't you check them? I did. None of your names figure. These people never heard of the Wilcox murder. Hey, Inspector. Yeah, what do you want, Gibson? Hey, weren't you interested in some information about a dame named Stella Marlowe? Yeah. She was the first name on that list you gave me, right? Hmm. Uh, what about her? I just came through on the ticker. Stella Marlowe was found dead. Murdered. <laughs> I just got in. I've been down to the police library setting the file on the Wilcox case. All right, forget about that. Now, listen. I want you to lock your door and all the windows. I'm sending down a red-headed cop to guard you. What? Don't let any dark-haired guy into your house, even if he's your own best friend. What's this all about? We're dealing with a homicidal maniac. The body of Stella Marlowe was dismembered. Dismembered? Tell my man to call me at headquarters when he arrives. Goodbye. Goodbye. After I hung up the phone, I noticed the little black box on the living room table. How it got there, I don't know, because my house was locked all day. I undid the black ribbon, opened it. What I saw inside, fascinated and horrified me. It was a human hand. Suddenly a thought clicked in my mind. I recognized something on there. This is Ray Johnson. Yeah, what is it? Did you ever find out what happened to Stella Wilcox? Huh? She's the stepdaughter of the murdered Laura Wilcox. Why do you want to know? Well, she was suspected of the murder for a time. Listen, will you drop that angle? Will you just answer one or two questions? Did the killer dismember the whole body in the Stella Marlowe murder? Just the hands. Fine. Did she have on a large diamond ring, the third finger on the left hand? Yes. The friends say she wore it all the time, but how do you... I've got it here. Someone sent me a hand with a ring on it. What? And get this, there's a name engraved inside the ring. The name is Laura Wilcox. What? There's a scar on the thumb. There was a scar on the left thumb of Stella Wilcox's print in your file. I took a fingerprint. The prints on the hand and the fingerprints of Stella Wilcox are identical. Are you sure? Yes. Stella Marlowe and Stella Wilcox are the same person. Did 
you find anything else there? Yes. Black hair and the fingernails. I'm coming down to your place as fast as I can get there. Goodbye. Goodbye. The front door slammed the second after I hung up. I turned around. Coming toward me was a man with jet black hair. <laughs> You know, I can say sudden, horrible death when it happens to other people, but when it happened to me, I... well, the man with the jet black hair looked quietly at me and said, I'm Robert Lane. You're Raymond Edward Johnson, I believe? Yes. Inspector Bell spoke to me about you. Can I sit down? What do you make of all this? I don't know what to make of it. Heard what happened to Stella Marlowe? Yes. Do you know that's not her real name? Yes, she was the stepdaughter of Laura Wilcox, but... Uh, How do you know? I think I know more about this than you imagine. Is your name really Robert Lane? Why? That was a chauffeur in the Wilcox home, a man named Lowry. I wonder if... There's no harm in telling you now. Yeah, I'm that chauffeur. And Amelia Cardway? She was Mrs. Wilcox's maid. Now, Johnson, the murder of Stella didn't come exactly as a surprise to me. Why? She poisoned her stepmother with the help of the maid, Amelia Cardway. But why am I involved in all this? Not fool each other. Somehow you discovered that Stella murdered her stepmother. But after ten years, you can't dig up any evidence, and you know it. So you invent this wild story about Gideon Blake. Just the right sort of psychological scare to frighten the two women into making a move that'll give them away. Very clever. Just a moment. What color is the hair of Amelia Cardway? Blonde. Pretty shade of blonde, in fact. Very attractive girl ten years ago. Oh, what's in the box? I advise you not to look. I rarely follow the advice of other people. I... Oh. Where'd you get this? Someone left it here this evening. That ring. Old Lady Wilcox gave that to Stella on her 18th birthday. That... The hand of Stella. I understand why you asked about the hair, Johnson. The hair under the fingernails is black. Just like mine. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if an analysis showed that it was mine. And you killed it. The point is that I don't intend to give up my life to amuse you and your little crime hobby. What do you mean? You're going to learn about crime, Raymond, through a direct personal experience. I'm going to kill you. Let go of me. I... He was a powerful man. His blow did me. I struck my head against the furniture. I lay down on the floor dazed. Like a slow motion picture, I saw Lane approach and lean over me. A long knife in his hand. You didn't expect to stir up this hornet's nest, did you? Crime and murder is very amusing, isn't it? Well, you'll find out just how funny it is. His arm raised his arm. I was powerless. He was driving the knife down. Suddenly... <laughs> I heard him scream. Somewhere the door slammed. And I blacked out. Here, here, get up, right? Mm-hmm. There you are. You're okay now. Come on, get up, get up. Ah, the door. Hey, what happened here? We found you on the floor, out like a knife. There was Lane, the Wilcox chauffeur. He tried to kill me. Lane? Lane's dead. There's the body. Huh? Did uh, you kill him, Ray? No. Where does Amelia Cardway live? Oh. A few miles from here, why? We've got to get over there right away. She killed the old lady, and she might have killed Stella, too. I don't see how Amelia Cardway could have done it. Maybe you'll tell me next that Gideon Blake did it. I don't know. Gideon Blake didn't have a hair on his head. Oh, besides, he's dead. I never arrest a dead man for the crime of murder. You can't get confessions on him. Perhaps Lane did go to see Stella shortly before she was killed. They were all in this together. Yeah. 
They told you they didn't know each other to protect themselves. Now, that still doesn't explain how the hand got to your place or why Gideon Blake came back from the dead or why we found those black hairs under the fingernails. Yeah, I've got an idea about the hand. Yeah? I think it was dismembered so that you would never know that Stella Marlowe was Stella Wilcox. Huh? She changed her appearance, but she couldn't change her fingerprints. Well, then who left it at your place and why? And why should you be on the murder list? Don't remind me of that, please. Well, here's Amelia Cardway's cottage. Maybe we'll get some of the answers here. Come on. What? Inspector. Help. Help. You hear that? Yeah, yeah. Come on, follow me, right? Inspector Doyle had his gun out and was running into the house. I followed a few steps behind. In a moment, I was in the living room. Doyle was standing there. Right? Well, what happened? Why did you scream for help? In an old chair sat what was once an attractive woman. The blonde hair was streaked with gray, but the face was a mask of terror. I recognized her from the picture in the police file. It was the former maid of Laura Wilcox, Amelia Conway. Yes, Mrs. Wilcox, in just a minute. Come in, Mrs. Wilcox. What's the matter with oh, her? Yeah, she's cracked you delirious. Uh, just keep sitting there like that, mumble. You can't live with secrets. Someone will find out. I'm glad. Glad they found out. Now she'll never come to see me again, Deborah. Yeah, well, who came to see you? Mrs. Wilcox. Uh, I didn't want to give her that medicine. I knew it was poison, but Stella made me. She made me. And so did me, the chauffeur. I'm getting out of the chair, Inspector. Uh, uh, look, there's a knife in her back. Uh, Miss Cardwell. There she is, at the top of the stairs. Mr. Wilcox. Where? At the top of the stairs, Inspector. Look, it's Laura Wilcox. I'll tell everything, Mrs. Wilcox. We were all in on it together. Tell her the chauffeur and me. I didn't want to do it. Forgive me for... I'm going upstairs. You look after her, right? The woman he reached the bottom steps. Mrs. Wilcox disappeared. I stood over the cardway woman. She was dead. A burst of pistol fire came from the upstairs part of the house. A moment later, Inspector Doyle came tumbling down the stairs, the gun still in his hand. He was unconscious. I looked up. At the top of the stairs stood Mrs. Laura Wilcox. She said nothing, but calmly came down, holding the poker she had struck the inspector with. She bent down, took out the knife from the body of the dead Amelia Cartwright. To start, to frighten the move. Suddenly, the woman took off her hat, her wig, and there stood Gideon Blake. You'd better go now, Raymond. I don't understand that disguise. Put there, the entrance to the dining room. Fire! Yes, fire. You best leave at once. Those flames are spreading rapidly. Take Inspector Doyle with you. Great, you hurry. Yours is the last name on my list, you know. He didn't have to say any more. I dragged the inspector through the door. Gideon Blake turned, smiled at me, and walked directly into the flames. That was the last I ever saw. Found the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. Laura Wilcox was a twin sister of Gideon Blake. We uh, dug up the birth records. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why she looked so familiar. And that's why he murdered the three people. Because they killed his sister. He faked his own death in order to carry out justice himself. Yes, but that uh, still doesn't explain why I was brought into it. Uh -huh. a bit. <laughs> that's simple. He wanted us to know what was going on so that we didn't hold some innocent person. Mm -hmm. uh, just one more question. Yeah, go ahead. How did Blake fake his own death ten years ago? Uh, well, uh, now, we don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but he, he must have done it. Uh, did you find his body in the ashes of Amelia Cardway's cottage? Mm hmm? Mm, well, I guess they're there, but... Uh, well, it's impossible to identify them positively. Yeah, that leaves one other explanation. What's that? That Gideon Blake actually died ten years ago. A uh, word of 
give advice, naturally. When you get killed, don't let your murderer slice your hands off. Because then you can never put the finger on it. <laughs> Good night. Pleasant dreams. Uh-huh. have been listening to an inner sanctum mystery starring Raymond Edward Johnson. Tonight's presentation in the Mystery Playhouse. At this point in our program, Peter Laurie tells me we usually go to the green room for a preview performance of our next Mystery Playhouse attraction.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. on the outside. You're a lucky guy. Not many cons your age walk out of the can on their own power. Yeah, I'm not that old, Sam. Ah, come on. I seen your sheik. You was born August 3, 1899. A Leo. Only a Leo could take stir for 30 years like you done. What's it gonna be when you get out, Dolly? What are you gonna do? Do? First, I'm going to leave the fair city of Atlanta. I'm heading straight for Shy and see if they still got any of that good Canadian whiskey. I'm going to walk down a shaky joint on State Street. I'm going to walk through the loop. I'm going to get a lungful of that sweet air off the lake. While I'm enjoying myself, I'm going to kill one man so dead that he'll give the graveyard the willies. He's going to die a little for every day, every hour I've spent in here. What'll it be, sir? Uh, what are you making? Martini, extra dry, on the rock. Yeah. Hey, you're different. I've never seen you before. This whole joint's different. <laughs> so I'm different. Uh, what's he gonna be, Dad? <laughs> what do you mean, Dad? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean nothing. Take it easy, huh? Okay, okay. Hey, uh, give me some of that Canadian rye. Canadian rye it is. And leave the bottle there and give me a, a short beer. Short beer. Okay, that's better. Now you go find Lefty Milne for me and send them to me. Still hangs out here, don't he? Yeah, sure. Say, you must be Dolly Palatka, right? Big Dolly Palatka. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Palatka. Uh, my old man told me all about you. I'm sorry. All right, all right, forget it. Uh, Lefty said you'd be dropping in. He's waiting for you at the end of the bar. Where? You mean that guy? That's Lefty? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, Lefty! Hey, you! Hey, Russ! Who are you calling Russ? <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Dolly! <laughs> Big Dolly! Who'd you think it was, Buddy Rogers? <laughs> I've been waiting here all day ever since I got your letter. Hey, how'd you get my address? In the phone book. Imagine you being listening to phone books just like anybody else. Hey, you changed, Lefty. Yeah. You ain't been taking care of yourself. Hey, you been sick or something? What happened? Time, boss. Time. Boss? <laughs> I ain't been called boss since they sent me up. So tell me, what have you, you been doing all these years? You go back to bank jobs? No, boss. No bank. No nothing. Things sort of went to pieces when you fell out of the picture. Yeah, everybody went their way. The speaks went out, we had a depression, then there was a war. Everything was different. Now, if you ain't part of a big organization, you ain't nothing. They got it all tied up. No strike action, no protection, no bank jobs, nothing. Everybody's like, uh, legitimate. Yeah? Uh, what have you been doing all these years? Maybe you heard I done five armed robbers. Yeah, yeah, I heard something. Yeah. Tried to knock over a check cashing place. Yeah. After I got out of Joliet, I wasn't much good no more. Yeah, so what are you doing now? Now? Yeah, yeah, now. 
I'm uh, pushing a hack. Nah. No, kid. You know, sometimes I don't believe it myself. But it ain't bad. It ain't bad. <laughs> you were the best getaway driver in the business. Ah, I forget all that. Things are going to be different from now on. Big Dolly is back. Oh, what's on your mind, Dolly? Reorganization. And you're in it with me all the way, Lefty. We get the best of the old mob together, and we, we, we form our own gang. Like, like they don't understand today. Chicago style. We'll show these monkeys what it's all about. I ain't heard somebody say mob for a long time. Yeah, but it's been a long time, Dolly. How are you going to get started? First, I'm going to serve notice that I'm back by collecting a little debt that somebody owes. Yeah? Who's that? Frankie Carlo. Who's Frank Carlo? Oh, yeah, yeah, Fat Frank. <laughs> you ain't never forgotten, have you? Forgotten? <laughs> That's the only thing that got me through those miserable years. For the first ten in Atlanta, I ran a punch press. I cut fist-sized holes out of sheet metal. And every time the punch came down on a piece of tin with 2,000 pounds of pressure, I pretended it was Carlo's fat face. I killed him a thousand times a day. I lost everything because of that squealer. Now I want to hear him scream. Uh, it's been 30 years. He's probably forgotten if he ain't dead by now. Oh, no, he ain't dead. While I was in jail, he's been living the good life in some place they call Woodvale. I never heard of no Woodvale. Yeah, it's out toward Iron City. Oh. We used to call it Cabbage Town. Yeah, sure. That's, uh, the, that's where the Shamrock Gang used to hang out, right? Did he hook up with them? No, no. They're all gone a long time. I remember now. His old lady has a beauty parlor. Legit. What were you figuring? We're going to give him a ride and an overcoat. A concrete overcoat. to pick up Nutsy Dugan, right? What are you doing in the city park? You see the guy up there on the bench? Yeah. Up to the right. Uh, you, you mean the, the bum feeding the pigeons, huh? Yeah, that's Nutsy. You mean th that pile of rags? That's my bodyguard? That's right. How old is he now? Nutsy? Uh, 70, 72. Forget him. Well, he's only five, seven years older than me. I said forget him. He's an old man. How, how does he live? Well, he gets the Social Security check. About 15, maybe 20 years ago, he got a job as a doorman at a new apartment. Pretty nice job. A Nazi? Wearing a monkey suit? He retired a couple of years ago. Gets along pretty good. An old man. I mean, a really old man. Even you don't look like that. I mean, the bear. Tell me the truth, Lefty. Do I look old? Well, uh, you ain't the same guy I knew in 33. Yeah, but I still got the marks there. I got the muscle. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, boss. Uh, what do you say we go get Willie? I can find him. I don't want no more surprises. Lake Willie Hill. He was more of a sharp, snappy type guy. What's his record? Uh, maybe you better forget it, Dolly. He's half blind, lost an arm. Yeah? Well, was it a gang or the cops? No, uh, just got hit by a truck. Got a chunk of dough for it. He's got a nice newsstand downtown. Says he's better off than ever. Oh, he'd get a kick out of seeing you, boss. No, no, forget it. Okay, so we, uh, we changed the signal. How do you mean, boss? Forget the ride, forget the cement job. It's, it's just you and me now, Letty. Maybe maybe it's better that way. We, we'll take care of Frankie Carlo ourselves. You, you still want to go through with it? Ain't you got the message? We're washed up. Has been. We're through. Not me. 
Not the Dolly Palatka. I got plenty of fist left. I ain't gone through 30 years in a prison cell to sit on a park bench while Carlo goes free. And you're with me. Okay, okay. All you got to do is drive me while I drill Carlo and then take me to the Dutchman's hideout in Wisconsin. The Dutchman? He runs a motel now. Will he hide you? Yeah, I got a reservation right in this shoulder holster. Okay, boss. I'll drive. <laughs> Rita's wedding present. Now be careful. You break everything you touch. There's a lot of presents. Must be worth a lot of loot. Your daughter's having a nice, high-class marriage. No thanks to you. Let me see how you dress. Eh, you look all right, I guess. But just keep quiet. And maybe nobody will know that you were a fat Frankie Carlo. All right, all right. Why don't you forget it? How can I forget it on your daughter's wedding day? Anyhow, she's marrying a nice kid from a good family. And why shouldn't she? She's just as good as anybody. Everybody thinks the world of her. She's a wonderful girl. Yeah, hasn't been easy. Don't light that cigar in here. Look, I'm nervous. People may come over after the wedding and I don't want the house smelled up. Smoke a cigarette. I ain't got any cigarettes. There's a box of them right in front of you, stupid. Yes, hey, that's kind of cute. Don't pick that up. I'm just looking. What the... Be careful. Put it down. Don't yell. <coughs> oh, now you've done it. I've done it. You dropped it. You broke it. I wouldn't if you didn't yell at me all the time. It was a genuine crystal cigarette box from Rita's in-laws. I'm sorry. Honest, I'm sorry. You are sorry. I've been sorry from the first day I met you. What happened? Hey, what are you yelling about? Your father just broke that beautiful crystal cigarette box. Oh, no. That's what's happened. Michael's mother will ask about it. I just know she will. Oh, Pop... Why do you have to ruin everything you touch? Look, your father used to be a tough guy and a mob, and he still thinks he's a gorilla. Well, he acts like a gorilla. You ought to keep him in a cage. I'm sorry, Rita. It was an accident. I... You're always having accidents. Why can't I have a father like other people do? You... You're an old... Hey, wait a minute. I won't have you talking like that to me. Do you hear me? I won't have it, or I'll... Or what? Or nothing, that's what. Brother, I could think of a hundred better things to call you. Dolores, please. Not in front of the kid. She's not a kid anymore. She might as well hear everything. She's a woman. And she's got to live with knowing what her father is. This afternoon she becomes a wife, so there's no reason she can't hear everything that's to be heard. But that's what I mean, sort of. Now that she's getting married and there'll be new people around and all, can't we talk a little better to one another? It's been a long time since we had any good words between us. There's always trouble in the house. And whose fault is that? Who brought trouble into the house? Me? Who's the big shot gangster around here? Me? That was 30 years ago. If it wasn't for me, you would have been in prison 30 years ago. If I didn't make you tell the truth about Big Dolly Palatka, you'd be a convict, a jailbird. I never done any time. I ain't no criminal. Yeah. They only let you off because you gave evidence, and you only gave evidence because of me. Can't you ever forget it? Isn't it about time we buried the old days and forget them? I'll never forget them. And I won't let you forget them either. I had to beg and plead. And the judge put you on probation in my custody. My custody. And I've been there ever since. Yes, and you still are. One false move, Mr. Big Shot Gangster. And maybe I could still have you put in jail. Uh, what's the use? What's the use? Don't walk away from me like that, you, you torpedo. Oh, my arm, will you? Mother, please, not now. I'll teach you to turn your back while I'm talking. Mom! Uh, Mom! Uh, that's all right, Rhea. That's all right, Dolores. Slap all you want. Huh. You're only hitting a corpse anyway. So say what you want to say and do what you want to do. Doesn't matter. I don't matter. Nothing matters anymore. Why don't you just go in the living room, sit down, and shut up. Don't touch anything. Don't say anything. 
Maybe if you keep your mouth shut, nobody will know you're a freak. Dolly, ain't you been thinking? This is crazy. I went along with you because I thought you'd get the idea. Once you got used to being on the outside. Shut up and keep driving. This just ain't being done no more, boss. Except maybe on television. We're like a rerun, Dolly. Look, the guy is in his late 60s. What's the difference? Dolly, it's been 30 years. You got a few years left. Enjoy them. 30 years, that's what I've been thinking about. While I was in there for 30 years, he was laughing at me, eating, drinking, sleeping the way I wanted to do. I was going to live good with class. I hate to say this, Dolly, but you know, Hacken, I had a lot of time to think. We was never much good, our kind. Not to nobody else, not to ourselves. Maybe we got what we deserve. All right, now, look, what do you want, Al? Just drop me near the house and I'll pay the fare. Nah, I'll stick. What do you want me to do? Just cover the back door, that's all. How are you going to do? I'm just going to give him one good long look at me. A 30 year look. And then I'm going to slug him with as many bullets as this gun holds. Step on it, will you? Are you coming, Rita? Yes, Mom. Come on, Pop. I'm coming. Uh, I'll get it, okay? Hello? Yeah, it is him. Yeah? Thanks. Who is that? The bartender at Shakey. The place I used to go to in town. Where are you going? To the basement. i got to get something. But, Pop, Frankie, come back here. I don't like this. What are you doing down there? We want to leave, Frankie. What is it, Mom? You look like something's wrong. I don't know, but I'm afraid. I remember phone calls a long time ago. Frankie, what are you doing? Just getting ready for something I didn't count on. Where did you get that gun from? Just a little keepsake I hung on to. But I always kept it nice. Now listen to me, you two. Big Dolly is out. And he's on his way here right now. What are you doing? Turning a table over for a shield, that's all. Now pull down the shades and get upstairs. That's him. Get away from the windows. Get away from the door and, and get upstairs. Don't worry. He's in for a big surprise. Come on in. It's open. That's you, Frankie. Hello, Dolly. I've been waiting for you. Yeah, and I don't pull that trigger, Frankie. I'll get two of you anyway before I go down. I ain't making a move till you do, Dolly. Don't try nothing. Left these out in the bag. It's your move, Dolly. I want to hear you sing, Frankie. Baby, goodbye forever. Sing it with all you got. There won't be no encore, Canary. Now, just a minute, both of you. And you, Frankie, you, you ridiculous old man. Give me that gun. Stay away from me, Dolores. I said, give me that gun. Now, go and sit down on that couch and be quiet. I'll handle this. You're just a useless old man trying to be something you never were. But, Dolores. Fat Frankie Carlo. You were a cheap little hoodlum before I ever married you. And nothing at all after that. Imagine you trying to be big and brave all this child's play. You should have be ashamed of yourself. Ah, oh, Dolores. Happy. <laughs> Get a load of this. Boy, would you ever write about Frankie? <laughs> He's just a little silly old man. <laughs> and I thought he was living it up while I was down in the jug. <laughs> Theater 
Five has presented The Kiss-Off, written by Mordecai Siegel and directed by Ted... You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines with xylene, rich lube, all-weather motor oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, We escape to the jungles of South America and a seething tale of terror and violence as told by James Poe in Bloodbath, starring Mr. Vincent Price. By portaging the rapids and walking the mules in the shallower stretches, we'd managed to get our supplies and equipment more than 1,700 miles up the river. After this, further navigable passage being impossible, we'd traveled by foot, hacking our way through the thick, steaming jungle, coaxing and goading the heavily laden beasts. We'd left the jungle and begun the climb. Eleven days later, high in the Andes, we found our objective, and we set to work, hard work. And then, on a hazy afternoon in late May, we found it. I shall never forget the scene. Below us, the mountains swung down to the jungle which stretched eastward, far as the eye could see. The peaks above us had cut off the setting sun and the light had a curious violet quality. The dank, chill wind whispering and gusting set the sparse timber scrubs to trembling and shuddering and the mules, disdainful of their five strange masters, foraged the cacti and dwarf pine. The instruments were set up and the specimens were at hand and now, crouched and tense, We leaned forward. How about it, Hess? Wait. The tube's got to warm up. Come on, come on. Wait, will you? I've waited five years for this moment. Five, five hundred, you mean? Five million? Come on, Hessie. How about it, Hess? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Give him the sample, O'Brien. Yeah, here. Come on, baby. Shut up, will you? Shh. Here goes. Switch on. Holy cow. Good. Good. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Hesse. What's the word? Yeah, Hesse. Give. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Unless this machine is busted, unless this Geiger counter has forgotten its multiplication table, we have discovered the richest load of uranium ore known to man. I won't go into the details of how we'd come to locate the ore because that's a story in itself. Suffice it to say that late in the afternoon of that hazy May day, the five of us, gamblers all, came to the end of our rainbow, found our pot of gold. The vein runs all the way up the side of the mountain. Must be worth a million bucks. A million, a billion. A trillion bucks. (laughs) Do you boys realize what we've got here? Sure we do. We've got the world at our feet. Why, the man who gets the strike registered in his name can be a king. Every country in the world is going to come running up to him with trunks full of money and power. (laughs) Ah, you tell him, Hesse. Power? Yeah, we'll make the United States the most powerful nation on earth. 
Why the United States? Oh, you wouldn't sell to anybody else, would you? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Harris. You're a fool. No, no. I'm a businessman. A trillion bucks. <laughs> oh, gents, we've got the world at our feet. Split five ways. <laughs> world at our feet, split five ways. That night, as I lay huddled under my thin blanket, I wondered what it would be like being a wealthy man. Wondered if it were really true. Wondered how it would affect the others, how it would affect me. In the morning, we were to set off on the long return journey down to the jungle and through the jungle to the launch and down the river to civilization. There, we'd register our claim, purchase, if need be, the land, lease it, perhaps, from the government. Hmm. Oh, millionaires, world at our feet. Uranium, enough to blow up the whole universe. Power. Harris, wake up. Uh, oh, what's, what's wake the Wake up, time? Harris, wake up. Oh, good morning, millionaire. Weems, wake up. <laughs> the sun's coming up, hey. Huh? Hey, where are the others? They're gone. Huh? Gone? Yes, Dumont and O'Brien. They took the mules and most of the food and cut out. When? How do I know when? Sometime during the night. But why? Why? A trillion bucks, that's why. Oh, no, no, oh. no. Once they get down to the jungle, they'll have to travel on foot. There's ten days' march to the river. If they beat us to the boat, we're stuck with 1,500 miles of jungle between us and safety. Fifty? Impossible. We'd never make a hundred. That's right. We've got to catch them or we're dead. <laughs> Traveled as lightly as possible. It was a risky business, doubly so because O'Brien and Dumont had taken our guns with them. The only weapons we had between us were one long machete and two pocket knives. These would be of little protection against jaguars, bushmasters, tapirs, bow constrictors, and the rest of it. Fortunately, they'd left our number one necessity to survival. They'd forgotten to take our quinine. This and our food was all we carried. The long descent to the jungle was slow going on foot. It was here that we nearly gave up hope. We moved as fast as we could, but we were no match for men who were riding. But we reached the jungle. Then things took a better turn. Here the thick vines and heavy undergrowth was, we knew, almost an impossible hazard for a riding man. And we could see their boot prints mingled with those of the mules. We knew that they were having trouble, too. The animals were afraid of many things in the jungle. Would balk suddenly require careful handling? We pushed ahead as rapidly as possible, battling mosquitoes, pume flies, matukas, and the blood-sucking carpato ticks, and, of course, the jungle itself with its never-ending barrage of razor grasses, needle vines, swamps, bog traps, and so forth. It was hot, stinking hot, and the going was hard, but we had to make it. We couldn't travel at night. We'd taken our flashlights. We'd bundle up as best we could, protecting ourselves, not from the cold, it was hot and muggy even at dawn, but from the mosquitoes. And as we progressed towards the river area, from the bats, vampire bats. Ever seen them? <laughs> They're small, rather fragile-looking little things. By day, they hang heads down from the trees, wings folded like, like clusters of rotten fruit. By night, they hunt. They have razor-sharp teeth, bite like the finest steel scalpels. Their object is to break the skin very delicately, start the blood to coming, and then they simply hang on and sip. Without mosquito netting, we had a rough time of it, a sleepless time. But we managed to keep on going. And on the third day... Uh, uh, it's not yours, fellas. Uh, we can't make it to the river before them. We've got to, Weemsy. We've got to it's make it. right, Weems. And even if we do catch up, they got the guns. Shh, shh. Uh, huh? What are you stopping? Oh, quiet, quiet. I heard something. What did you hear? Shh. Gunfire. Yeah. Come on. They can't be more than a mile or two ahead. Come on. 
We ran through the jungle, following the fresh marks of the animals and the two men. And a half an hour or so later, we broke into a little clearing, and there was Dumont. He's dead. Shot in the back. <laughs> Good old Obi. Sweet guy, that Obi. Here, come on. Let's turn him over. <clears throat> He's really been sweating, huh? Uh, yeah. It's malaria. You see his face? Good old Obi. And Dumont came down with malaria, probably started to slow him down. Sweet guy, that Obi. Come on. Come on, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, they should have remembered the quinine. <laughs> I got no sympathy for Zuma. <laughs> you know, you know what would be nice? What? If that, if that Obi should get malaria now. Yeah. He'd be helpless. <laughs> He'd ask me for quinine. And I'd throw him a stone. On we went. Now there were no boot marks with the mule tracks. Apparently, O'Brien was riding one of the animals. From time to time, we'd see a flurry of tracks churned up as though he had had to dismount to tug one of the beasts back onto the trail. We followed the tracks for another two days, and then on the sixth day, we found one of the mules. How you feeling, boy? Huh? Where's your saddle? He really looks beat. Look at those marks on his flanks. Vampire bats. Yeah. That leaves O'Brien on foot. Yeah. Hey, hey, you hear that? Hey, it's the launch. We're to the river. He's starting the motor. Come on. Oh, uh, it wasn't very far, just a few hundred yards, and the path was strewn with O'Brien's discarded supplies. Quite suddenly, we came out of the jungle and onto a narrow white sandbar, the river. And there, not 30 feet away from us, just drifting off into the deep, dark, fast-moving waters, it was O'Brien in the launch. O'Brien! Beat you! <laughs> I beat you up! Look at him. He's like a beat skeleton. Obi! Wait for us, Obi! <laughs> the launch lurched dizzily as it floated downstream. O'Brien was feeble, sweating, possessed. He had the fever, had it bad. Come on, let's go after you him. You can't, this is piranha water. Cannibal fish, they'll eat you, have you? Yeah. Hey, Obi! Hey, you know me, Obi! Your old pal has me! Hey, what do you say, Obi, huh? Yeah. Huh? Bring him, pal. He staggered dizzily I about the, the cock that tried to start Look the engine. Him, he can't stand he up. was laughing and he was so weak that he could barely spin the flywheel to the kicker. Obi! He slipped! Huh? Good Lord, he's in the water! The fish, the piranhas! Oh! They got him! They got him! I ain't gonna look at this! One moment we saw him swimming weakly, his large, fever-ridden eyes turned imploringly toward us, and. The next moment, he was gone, leaving only a large red churning patch on the water. The piranhas are small, rarely more than 12 or 14 inches long, small fish with large, powerful jaws, teeth like broken glass, and an insatiable, maniacal appetite for flesh. The launch, caught by the deep, fast-moving waters, rocked softly this way and that, and moved on downstream. Away. Away around a bend and out of sight. The march of science over the years has produced better than ever gasoline for your car. But now science adds one of the greatest gasoline components of all. It's called xylene. Xylene, a super gasoline component, adds two great qualities to gasoline. Xylene gives higher than ever Antinoc performance. Xylene means power. Today, every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains xylene. If you want a motor that runs quiet as a whisper, if you want pickup and power to spare, try Richfield gasoline with xylene. Your Richfield dealer offers a choice of two great Richfield gasolines with xylene. Richfield High Octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield Ethel. Ethel at its best for tip-top results in the highest compression motors. Drive in where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Get Richfield Gasoline with Xylene. Xylene, one of the highest Antinoc components in gasoline history. And now we return you to... Escape, starring Vincent Price.
We picked over the supplies O'Brien had left on the shore. There wasn't much we wanted. A gun without ammunition, a few tins of food, a tent and some bedding, cooking equipment, a coil of rope. We loaded these things onto the mule and set off through the jungle, downstream along the river's course. Fifteen hundred miles to civilization. We had it tough. The jungle was thick along the river's bank, and we made little progress. Not more than five miles that day, but the next day, we rounded a bend, keeping close to the shore, and there, about a quarter mile below us, and nuzzling the opposite shore, grounded on the sand, lay the launch. Looks shallow enough here. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, but what about the fish? How deep does it look to you, Harris, at the deepest spot, I mean? Oh, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet, maybe three. Huh? Most of it's less than that. I got an idea. Shoot. We got to get across the launch, see? Yeah. So here's what we do. We throw away everything. There'll be food and water in the launch, see? Yeah. Now, you see that little patch of sand in the middle of the river where the bar shows? Yeah. We go that way. That's bound to be the shallowest way, see? How do we go? On the mule, the three of us. Ah, you nuts. This mule ain't in such bad condition it can't get the three of us across 70 feet of shallow water. What do you say, Harris? Why not? All right, I'll get aboard first. Come on. Get farther up, Weemsy. You're the lightest. Yeah. Harris, you get on next. Yeah. Hang on to Weemsy. Yeah. Here, here. Carry this coil of rope around your neck. We may okay. need it. I've got the machete strapped to my back. Hey, you set, Weems? Yeah. <laughs> Now hold tight to me, Hess. Don't worry. If I go, you go too. Yeah. And if he goes, I go. So let's hang on, gents. Yeah. Let's really hang on. As long as he's moving fast, he can't get at his legs. Ain't that right? He's not showing anything to him but hoofs and hair. Hold his head up, Weems. Don't let him look down. Uh, now, you all set? Yeah, all set. All right, here we go. All right, get off. Come on, you right. Come on, baby. I felt the mule Big lurch when he stepped baby. into the water. Oh, the sand was on, softer spit. here than on the shore. Of sand, huh? Ahead, Come not on, 40 feet away, lay the Come little on. spit of land. The mule refused to run, couldn't run, and before he'd taken ten steps, I knew he was too weak to support the three of us. From every direction in the swirling water about us came small, shadowy, dark shapes. Come on. The piranhas. Don't stop. Come on, baby. Come on. Keep moving, baby. Come yeah. on. Move along, baby. He can't do it. You gotta do it, baby. Come on. Sweet Come on. mother. What are those? The piranhas were churning the water about us, and coming in from beyond them, were four or five long, dark shapes, six and seven feet long, thick and wriggling. Eels, electric eels. Uh, they'll sting them. Get along to the bar. Get him to the sandbar. Faster, faster, come on. Uh, made it. It's true about electric eels. I can throw a jolt that'll kill a jaguar. They got jaws like a vice. So, here we are, gentlemen, stuck. Just 30 feet of water between us and the shore. Get across it, and we can get to the launch and the civilization and all the rest oh, of it. the three of us are too much for that mule. Uh, only 30 feet. Why, you could run it in seconds. You see those little shadows around us in the water? I see those little shadows around us. You don't have to drop pictures. Hey. Oh, here's another bright idea coming up. As a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, hold on to your hat, Harris. We got that curl of rope. Yes. The mule could carry one of us. That mule's not in such bad shape, you know. Yes. Tie the rope over his bridle. Then... One of us pulls him over with him fast, you see? One rides, and then the other two pull him back. Yeah. yeah. And the next one gets on. Yeah. What do you say? Oh, he can't stay here. It's a natural. Who uh, goes first? Me, on account I'm the lightest. I won't tire him so much. How about it, Harris? All right. Well, get going, then. Okay. Tie that rope to his bridle. I'm doing it. All right, give me the machete. What do you want the machete for? I want it, that's all. Give me. Okay. All right, Here. now you two get at the end of the spit. So it's when you pay out the line, you don't get it caught in his legs. Well, you think of everything. That's right, I'm a smart boy. Ready with the line. You sure it's tied fast to the bridle? Yeah, I'm sure. No funny business, Weems. All we got to do is jerk this rope once while you're over that water and you're done for. You're a sharp article. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But not sharp enough. Hey, Weems, you cut the rope. So long, sucker. The rope. Our only salvation was cut. And now Weems, grinning and riding, was out into the stream, heading for the shore and safety. He went not 15 feet when one of the long, dark, wriggling shapes made for the mule and got his leg. Hey, get away from me! 
The mule reared up on his hind legs, the eel clinging to his foot, pumping paralyzing shocks into him. Weems clutched his neck with one hand and slapped him on the flank with the flat of the machete with the other. The mule came down and more eels went for his legs. He began to lurch sideways. Weems swung the long steel blade in an arc, barely missing the mule's leg and connected with one of the eels. His hair seemed to stand on end. His other arm released the mule's neck. The arm holding the blade was extended stiffly, still caught in the thick muscular back of the electric eel. And then the mule reared again, and Weems fell back into the water. The mule, freed of Weems, made the shore and vanished into the jungle. We turned away. No man could watch what was happening to Weems and retain his sanity. And so, there we were. Hess and I on that sand spit which the river was slowly washing away. Night coming, vampire bats coming, and all about us, the electric eels and the little cannibal fish waiting. There was no moon. There were evil stars, red and yellow. It was a black sky, and against it, blacker shapes, the vampire bats. We waved our arms and kept them off, but again and again, during that long and terrible night, they brushed against us, squealing and squeaking, trying to get us. Dark, evil, thirsting bats. A thousand years later came the dawn. That water's taken a lot of sand away. This thing isn't much bigger than a card table. Mm. Look at them. Look at those fish. You think they had enough to eat yesterday? Mm. Mm. Listen, Harris. No matter what happens now, at least you and I have played it square, right? Yeah, that's right, Harris. Shake my hand, Harris. All right. Because I think I got an idea on how we can get out of here. What? Yeah. Look up there. Yeah. See, see that vine hanging down from the big tree? It's over the water and it must be 15 feet up. Yeah, yeah, but if you were on it, you could do a tars into the shore. The rope? Oh, that's right. Now, if we can just lasso the end of that and pull tight, we'll have enough swing to make it across. Swing like a pendulum, if you follow me. One guy gets on the other's shoulders to swing over to get the start, see? Then when he gets to shore, he fastens a rock and swings the rope back to the other. Oh, that vine will hold, it'll work. It took us two hours before we managed to lasso the end of that vine. And then we tested it again and again until we were positive it would hold a man's weight. And then we were ready. Ah, you stand good and steady now, pal. I'm going to go easy on you, but don't shake. Because if you spill me in that water, I'm a gone guy. I'm ready. <clears throat> I'm ready. Good luck. Uh, here. No! I felt his feet leave my shoulders, and then he was off, skimming the water with his feet drawn up, and then, miraculously, he was on the shore. Good boy! <laughs> good boy! <laughs> yeah! And like a breeze, huh? <laughs> like a breeze. Hey, uh, any rocks around there? Sorry. He smiled at me and shrugged, and then looked down the stream at the launch. I knew that smile, that trillion-dollar smile. It said, so long, sucker. Don't do it, Hess. Send me the rope. <laughs> You're too nice a guy, Harris. You and I would never get along. You, you can have it all, Hess, every scrap of it. Only for the love of mercy, send me the rope. No, no, you'd want some. You wouldn't approve of what I mean to do with it. Hess! <laughs> he stood there laughing at me and shaking his head slowly. But a... Above him, just over his head, was another vine, thick and mottled, and it was moving. Look out, Hess! Hess! <laughs> he didn't understand or didn't hear me. Just stood there smiling and shaking his head. The boa constrictor dropped heavily and accurately, a thrashing tangle of scaly musk. <laughs> The sun was hot, blistering hot. 
I was alone, all alone, except for the ever-waiting piranhas. Hess's body was hidden by the low, scrubby vines and palmettos. Several hours later, I saw the boa, now gorged, slither lumpily away. I waited, and I waited. From time to time, I thought of stepping out into the stream. It would be over very quickly, I told myself, very quickly. But I, I couldn't. And then I noticed an odd thing. The current which had been sweeping the sand away had shifted slightly. A whim, a miracle. And now new sand from some sunken bar was beginning to pile up between me and the shore, grain by grain, rib by rib. I watched this. And I watched. And I watched. And at five o'clock that afternoon, I walked ashore to the lawn. And didn't even get my feet wet. It's nice where I live. Quiet little streets, nice people, nice kids, nice country, peaceful, nice peace. I know where there's enough uranium to blow it all to hell. Want it? <laughs> Just go up the river. <laughs> up the river, it's, uh, it's for the taking. Ask Dumont and Obi and Weems and Hess. A trillion bucks worth. Enough to give the whole world a bloodbath. Yourself included. Warm summer weather makes you think of baseball games, picnics, and holiday driving. But be sure your car is ready when you are. Get Richfield All Point Safety Service. The service that puts your car in top shape for warm weather driving. With Richfield All Point Safety Service, you get a careful All Point lubrication job that protects the chassis, transmission, and differential. You get lubricants that stick to your car's ribs no matter what the temperature. You get the protection of Rich Lube All Weather Motor Oil, the Pennsylvania premium grade oil that cleans as it lubricates. You also get a safety check of batteries, spark plugs, tires, and radiators and expert service if your car has automatic transmission. The Richfield gasoline dealer is specially trained to protect your car against wear and breakdown. So get Richfield All Point safety service tomorrow. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight starred Mr. Vincent Price. Bloodbath was written by James Poe. Others in the cast were Wally Mayer, Ted DeCorsia, Paul Fries, and Tony Barrett. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea, moving carefully, step by step, dreading to find what you know is there. Death in the form of a deadly Bushmaster from which there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape to the Caribbean and a grim voyage of impending death as Martin Storm tells it in his exciting tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. Goodbye then until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. Countdown for blastoff. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, 
Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X X, 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 minus minus one. one. Tonight, the science fiction classic, Knock, by Frederick Brown. Tonight, we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door. What's that? Good morning, man. What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Who are you? I am Zan. I'm still asleep, I must be. You are not asleep. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. Oh. I guess I'm awake. Who... What are you? I am a Zan. What's that? A Zan is intelligent life. Look, I don't... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven? But you mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. And what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes. That is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. How about the people? What about the population of the world? You are the population of the world. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. I, I can't... I don't understand what's happened. The Zan have landed on your planet. We have removed the lower life forms to prepare for colonization by the Zan. When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. What? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh. I'm uh, Walter Phelan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. How do you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. It is a primary type of auditory communication. Oh, is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What will you want further in your room? Do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Then you better bring me my books. That uh, there will be done. That's rather considerate of you. You know, I've got to call you something. Do you mind if I call you George? It is immaterial. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. Oh, that's all right, George. Just uh, call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. Come in. Oh, hello, George. Hello. Wait a minute, you're not George, you're different somehow. It makes no difference. The sun are many, and they are one. Then I'll call you George, too. I'll call you all George. Uh, what can I do for you? Point one. You will please henceforth sit with your chair facing the other way. Uh-huh, I thought so, George. That plain wall is different from on the other side, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. How many other animals do you have in the zoo, George? 216. <laughs> Not complete, George. Even a Bush League zoo could beat that. Did you just uh, pick at random? Yes. All species would have been too many. Male and female, each of 108 kinds. Male and female, huh? Of uh, 
All the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Mm, anyone I know? Uh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, uh, what do you feed us all, eh? For carnivorous species, we make synthetics. Flora was not hurt by the vibrations which destroyed animal life. Oh, nice for the flora. Well, George, you started out with point one. I deduce there is a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Oh? Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. Don't worry, George. It happens in the best regulated zoos. What is wrong with them, Walter? Nothing much. They're just dead. Dead? Mm Mm-hmm. That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, maybe they just died of old age. Old age? I do not understand. You don't? How old are you, George? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I am still young. Yeah, babe in arms. Look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've got somebody you don't know where you come from. An old man with a beard and an hourglass and a scythe. Your vibrations didn't kill him. What is he? Oh, old man death. Down here, our people and animals live until somebody, the Grim Reaper, stops them. He will stop more? He gets us all, George. With your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. <laughs> Looks like you made a mistake, George. And I don't think there's much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zan is a logical being. We will take action. Oh, George, uh, where are you taking me? We will be there shortly. We will bring your books and your chair. You mean my lease is up? Uh, I do not understand. It's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Go inside. Oh, be careful with those books, George. Don't lose my... Oh, uh, excuse me. Who are you? What are you doing here? I guess George didn't explain. Uh, George uh, tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What's all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why, but uh, let's go back a bit. Do you know just what has happened otherwise? No, not exactly. Well, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of an advanced scouting party. I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Yeah, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration. It destroys all sorts of animal life. I don't know whether they did it all at once or if they had to circle the earth a few times, but they killed everybody. No, I was afraid The cheerful note is that you and I and uh, 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You do know this is a zoo, don't you? I suspected it, but I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. My hunch is they used the vibrations just low enough to knock us all out, and then they cruised around picking up samples at random. When they were all set, they... Turned the juice on full blast. How terrible. Yeah, well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing shortage, wars, even the atomic bomb. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. Only they made a mistake. They underestimated us. I don't understand. (laughs) They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can be killed, but... The Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are are more than two of us? Oh, not more of our species, no. These were merely fellow animals, a rabbit and a canary. And by the Zans' way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece. It's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in the zoo. Well, didn't they even know we'd all die eventually? I don't think so. Uh, George... That is, the the second Zan I saw told me he was 7,000 years old, and he's young by their standards. When they learned how quickly we die, they they were practically shocked to the core, if they have cores. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo, two by two. 
What, are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? Yeah, I'm afraid so. There's plenty of furniture, though, and George promised to bring me my chair. We've got to do something. Why? Well, I don't know. It just, just seems to me we owe it to the human race to do something. Oh, well, uh, perhaps you have a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I've been studying them. They look horribly different, but I think they have about the same metabolic and digestive system as we. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. But you said 7,000 years. Yeah, I, I, I think I figured it out. Now, George cut his, uh, I suppose you'd call it his hand, when he brought in my books. Started to bleed, red blood. But I could see the cut closing as he stood there. By the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Well, you see... Whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zan. Their regenerative powers must be unlimited. They just don't wear out. They go on and on until they're stopped. Suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Oh. What would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put up a sign saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'll even have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. It just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm... I'm sorry. Well, not at all. It was a pleasure. Uh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one. I have brought your books. Mm-hmm. Point one, eh? Uh, what else is on your mind? Another creature sleeps and will not wake. Oh? A small feathered one called a duck. Well, it happens, George. I warned you. Old man death, the grim reaper. I told you about him. Walter, the Council of Zan has met. It has been decided logically that a... No life form can withstand the full strength vibrations with which we cleared your planet. Therefore, the Grim Reaper you spoke of does not exist. Mm, pretty neat, George. What's B? B, the only intelligent life to escape the vibrations, is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you are off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You've got me. Yes, we have. It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get the information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, now hold on, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Uh, let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. <laughs> Now, you should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more than its ermine. This is the reptile cage. Mm hmm. Here are the ducks. That is the male. The female has been stopped. Yeah, lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? Lonely? Hmm? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. Well, you got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us now how it is done. I've told you, George, I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well, we will have to take further action. Oh, well, what are you going to do, George? We will go back now to your room. What happened, Mr. Phelan? Uh, you might call me Walter. After all, George does. And we have more in common. Please, what happened? Oh, just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He wants me to tell him how. Did you? Look, I'm just an ordinary anthropologist. There's no telling what those animals died of. Just natural causes. But George can't see it that way. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. Hmm, what? At least we can get back at them some way. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow. If you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? Well, they murdered the whole and the human race. I suppose so, but uh, we can't change that now, so why think about it? We just can't sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. But at least we could be fighting. I can't see the virtue in that. I was more or less content with my books, and we've got George to talk to. Of all the men in the world they had to pick... Don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting to the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? I can't really explain it, but, Walter, if there was any good in man, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and, in the end, even against himself. He kept on fighting for what he thought was right, and we're all that's left. Walter, we, we just can't end by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. There isn't much left for us. 
We could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend there's a secret about death. We could refuse to tell them anything. Well, there isn't anything to tell. But they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. Well, I suppose the worst they can do is kill us. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now you will tell us how these animals are stopped. George, this may come as a shock to you, but I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. Neither was my grandfather. He charged a Yankee battery with one round of ammunition and a corncob pipe. You are not logical, but that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Go now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight, Walter. Remember that. We've got to go out fighting. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Go now, Walter. Goodbye. It's uh, been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Go now, Walter. After you, my dear George. level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. <laughs> Walter, Walter, you are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now, you will tell us now how you stop the animals. Let me alone, let me alone. We have had vibration levels one and two. There are still 15 more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, 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 let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. It's tough, you better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. You let me go? That is correct. Oh, that's uh, real nice of you, George. I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. No, no, no George, George, you can't do that. No, listen, George. George, there is no secret. Can you understand that? There is no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal cage next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. Uh, the animal... Animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, no. no, no. Listen, George. You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you now. I, I give up. But you've got to promise to leave the woman alone. You promise, George? If we receive the answer from you, Walter, there will be no further need for the vibrations. Well, I guess that'll have to do. All right. All right. Take me to that stopped animal. I'll tell you how to save the mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Just uh, let me catch my breath a minute. What did they do? What happened? After a while, I told them what they wanted to know. Oh, no. As uh, George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. But you promised. I know. It was no. our last chance to beat them on even one little thing. Well, perhaps. Do you mind if I sit down? You gave up. Well, I suppose you could call it that. I'm very tired. Oh, they've beaten us completely then. There isn't even anything we can do. The last of the human race, and we give up. We don't even die fighting. Oh, it isn't that bad. Uh, nothing might turn up. Uh, what did you call me? Uh, uh, huh? No, I, I must have said Martha. Sorry, she was my wife. She died two years ago. 
What were you saying? Nothing, nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. It's too late for the whole human race. What now, George? The council of the Zan has met. Oh, something wrong, George? The Zan has been stopped. What? The Zan is dead? That is correct. Well, you didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zan. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Walter. No, no, you've got it wrong, George. The council has decided. This time you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? Oh, they, uh, they have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes. And I... I thought... Oh, Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to, to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man, Walter. No, not very. There isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait. Hmm? What's that? I have been told... Another Zan has died. Uh, now, now, will you believe me? The Council of the Zan meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you, it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. What now? The Council has decided. This is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the Zan. Oh, Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George. And uh, don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. board now. So wonderful to feel the sun and the wind again. Yeah, they've closed the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Yes, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this, Grace. The Zan leaving Earth forever. And they're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's all over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I, I still don't understand. Walter, what made them go? <laughs> well, I just uh, I just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know. At 7,000 years, he was going to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Look out for the step. Well, uh... You remember when the first animals died? The rabbit and the duck? Yeah, and their mates just started to pine and waste away? Yes. Well, that worried the Zan. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So finally, I broke down and told them about affection. Affection? Yes. And then I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? Here we are. Grace, meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? That's what the Zan wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Hmm? <laughs> I even showed him how. Here, fella, come on. Come here. Yeah. I held Donald in my arms, and I petted him a while. Then I let the Zan take over with the animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. You mean this cage? Mm-hmm. Watch out. Don't go too close. Walter, it's a rattlesnake. Yeah, yes. Their metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch that they could be poisoned. Well, then it was the snake that killed the two Zan. Mm-hmm. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. Well, I, I suppose... I it... thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so ashamed. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought if you hadn't pushed me. Well, I... Well, we've got a world to plan. A new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones it'd be safer to keep in. But first, there's a bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. We've got to make a decision about that. Pretty important one. 
Well, yes, but... It's been a nice race, even if nobody won it. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. No. It's the Garden of Eden all over again. Uh, but Eve, you'll have to watch out for that snake. Now, don't. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. You know, funny, you, you even blush like Martha. Only uh, you're stronger than she was. Prettier, too. I, I, I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear. If you'll give me time. Now, Walter Phelan, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that I... Well, that I we thought can... it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. So, Grace, if you could only... No. I wouldn't marry you if, if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. All right, my dear, but think it over. And please come back. <laughs> You see, I told you, it wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes? The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in, Grace, my dear. You see, it wasn't horrible at all. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Knock by Frederick Brown, adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Alex Scorby as Walter, Laurie March as Grace, and Louis Van Ruten as the Zan. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Now, next week. A strange and chilling story from the Bureau of Missing Persons. The story of what occurred when they accidentally intercepted a shortwave message. A cry for help from a missing atomic scientist who told them the fantastic story that he was now the man in the moon. How did it happen? You'll hear next week at X minus one. Join the Abbots on another baffling mystery tonight over most NBC radio stations. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Adventures in Time and space, told in future tense. Dimension X, 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 X. Can you predict the future? Can you tell what will happen in a hundred years? Or in ten? Or in the next minute? Can you look beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown, Dimension X? Tonight we have a strange story to tell, 
a sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. <laughs> Think it over. Suppose you were the last man alive on earth. In the universe, for that matter. The last man sitting alone in a room, and suddenly there was a knock on the door. What knocked on the door? You wonder, don't you? Your mind, faced with the unknown, supplies something vaguely horrible. But it isn't horrible, really. You'll see. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door. What? Oh, what's that? Good morning, man. What? What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Well, who are you? I am Azan. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No, no, I, I guess I am awake. Who? What are you? I am Azan. Well, what's that? Azan is intelligent life. Why do... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven? You mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Well, then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. Well, how about the people? There is no longer any use for large numbers of lower life forms. Therefore, we have dispensed with them. Dispensed with... You mean you've... When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. Uh, what? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh, oh, uh... Well, I, I'm Walter Phelan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. H how is it you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language, very type of auditory communication. Oh. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What will you want further in your room? Well, do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Then you better bring in my books. Uh, uh, I got to call you something. Do you, do you mind if I call you uh, George? It is immaterial. All right then, George. You know, I, I can't really believe this. That is a characteristic of low life form. I'm trying to take this in without going off balance completely. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. It's all right, George. Just call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George, I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. Yes, the last man on Earth sat alone in a room, a rather peculiar room. He just noticed how peculiar it was, and he'd been studying out the reason for its peculiarity. His conclusion didn't horrify him, but it annoyed him. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Oh, hello, George. Hello, Walter. Well, what can I do for you? Point one, you will please henceforth sit with your chair pointed the other way. I thought so. That plain wall is different from the other sides, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. That's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. I knew it. And if I persist in sitting with my back to it, what then? You'll kill me, I ask, hopefully? No, we will not kill you. That's too bad. George, I'll face the bars and perform for the people. I, I mean for the Zans. How many other animals do you have here in the zoo, George? 216, a male and female each of 108 kinds. Male and female of, of all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Anyone I know? Never mind, it doesn't matter anyway. Well, George, you started out with point one. I suppose there's a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. 
They are cold. What is wrong with them, Walter? Well, they must be dead. Dead? That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, sure, they, 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 they just died. But I have told you they were alone. Nothing stopped them. George, do you mean to tell me that you don't know what natural death is? Death is when a being is killed, stopped from living. Maybe these animals just died of old age. Old age? I do not understand. George, how old are you? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I'm still young. Now look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've, we've got somebody that's a stranger where you come from. Down here, our people and animals live until the Grim Reaper stops them. This uh, Grim Reaper stopped the two animals? That's right. He will stop more? Oh, he gets us all, George. This is a new factor we have not considered. But you can consider it. Because when the Grim Reaper gets through, there won't be very much left of your zoo. You mean he will stop more animals soon? Well, with your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute. We'll all be gone. Now, it looks like you made a mistake, George. I don't think there's very much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zahn is a logical being. We will take action. <laughs> taking me, George. We will be there shortly. You mean, uh, it's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble. Go inside. Uh, be careful with those books, George. Don't, don't lose... Excuse me. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, I guess George didn't explain. George tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What is all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why. Why? You see, I, I, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of a, sort of an advanced scouting party. Yes, I saw their spaceship as big as a mountain. They're moving in on us. They cleaned off the earth with some kind of vibration that destroys all sorts of animal life. They killed everybody. Oh, no. I was afraid. Well, the cheerful notice that you and I and 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You know that this is a zoo, don't you? Yes. I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing, shortages, wars. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, that is, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. If only they made one mistake. They overestimated us. I don't understand. They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can, they can be killed. The Zons don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are more than two of us? No, no, no more of our species. The, the, these were merely brother animals. A rabbit and a canary. And by the Zons' way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece anyway. Well, it's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in their zoo. But didn't they know that we'd all die eventually? No, I don't think so. See, George told me he was 7,000 years old and he's supposed to be young. When they learned how quickly we die, well, they were probably shocked to the core, if they have cause. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo two by two. Oh. Sure, they figure we'll last longer collectively, if not individually. But if they think... That is, if you think, for one minute... No, no, don't, don't, don't worry. I don't. But are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? I'm afraid so. It's horrible. I agree with you perfectly, my dear. But all personal considerations aside, the least favor we can do the human race is to let it end with us. 
I don't see much point in continuing it just for an exhibition in a zoo. How can you just sit here and and lecture? Have it, have it. But we've got to do something. Why? I don't know. It, it just seems we owe it to the human race to do something. You've got a suggestion. There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. You see, I, 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 I figured it out, I think. George cut his... Well, I suppose you'd call it his hand when he brought in my books. It started to bleed, red blood, but I could see the cut closing just as he stood there. And by the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Don't you see? Whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zahn. I... They just go on and on and on until... Well, until they're stopped. Yeah. But suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Well, but what would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put a sign out saying, beware of the man, dangerous. I don't think they'd have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife, she died two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. No, not at all. Oh, it'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello. George? Hello, Walter. Point one, I have brought your books. Point one? Hmm? Well, what else is on your mind? Point two, another creature sleeps and will not wake. A small feathered one called a duck. It happens, George. I warned you. Old man, death, the grim reaper. I told you all about him. Walter, the Council of Zahn has met. It has been decided logically that the only intelligent life to escape the vibration is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is... You are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you're off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. Are you boys afraid you're going to lose the whole zoo? It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. Now, wait a minute. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, wait a minute, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. You should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more then. Then it's an ermine. This is the reptile cage. Here are the ducks. This is the male. The female has been stopped. <laughs> Lucky girl. What's the matter, fella? You lonely down there? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. You got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us how it is done. I told you, George, I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Well, what are you going to do, George? We have methods of action you will know soon. We will go back now to your room. Call me Walter. After all, George does, and we have more in common. Oh, please, what happened? Just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. What? Well, at least we can get back at them. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow, if you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? They've wiped out the whole human race. They've murdered everybody. I suppose they have, but we can't change that now, so why think about it? Well, we can't just sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. Oh, of all the men in the world they had to pick. Don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting until the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? Well, I... 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 I can't really explain, but... Walter, if there was any good in man at all, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and in the end even against himself. But at least he, he kept on fighting for what he thought was right and... and we're all that's left. Walter, we just can't... can't end it by, by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. Oh, look, there isn't much left for us, but we could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend that there's a secret about death, and we could refuse to tell them anything. But there isn't anything to tell. Well, they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. I suppose the worst they can do is to kill us. Oh, Walter. All right. 
right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now, you will tell us how these animals are stopped? George, this may come as a great shock to you. But I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, call it a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. But that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Come now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight. Remember that, Walter. We've got to go out fighting. I think you're right. Come now, Walter. Goodbye. It's been a pleasure, Sevens. I am waiting. Come now, Walter. After you, my dear George. You will tell us now, Walter? That was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave, if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. You will tell us now? You know, George, I can't figure it out myself, but I'm stubborn. Maybe it has something to do about the dignity of man, the civilization such as it was that you wiped out. I do not understand. I didn't think you would. So go ahead. Vibrate. Vibration level two. It will be very painful, Walter. <laughs> Walter, you are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us how you stop the animals. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels 1 through 10. There are still 15 more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, 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 let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. That's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. You mean you're going to let me go? That is correct. That's real nice of you, George. I, uh, I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. Oh, no, no, George, you can't do that. Why not, Walter? It is the logical plan. No, 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 she, she couldn't take it. Yes, that is what we expect. Therefore, we will go and bring the woman here. No, now listen to me, George. There is no secret. Do you understand that? There's no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. And I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. Well, I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal caged next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. The animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, listen, George. George, do you want the, you want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you. Take me to that stopped animal, and I'll tell you how to save its mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Yeah, just, just... Just let me catch my breath a minute. What happened? Well, after a while, I told them what they wanted to know. You didn't? Sure. As George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. You gave up? I suppose you can call it that. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm very bad. <sighs> Something might turn up, Martha. But, I... but they've beaten us completely, then. There isn't anything we can do. Most of the human race. And we give up. We don't even die fighting. You call me? Hmm? Oh, I must have said Martha. I, I, I'm sorry. The Council of the Zan has met. Something wrong? Uh, she, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. Too late. 
the hose. What now, George? Zahn has been stopped. What? Zahn is dead? That is correct. You didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zahn. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Oh, uh, you got it wrong, George. I didn't stop that Zahn. It's just death. It gets all of us here. You will be eliminated now. But, George, it won't do any good to kill us. It won't save you. Everything that lives on Earth must die. That is not logical. But it's true. The council has decided. This time, you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? They have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes, yes. And I... Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man. Well, there isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait, what's that? I have been told another Zahn has died. Now. Now will you believe me? The Council of the Zahn meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. And now what? The council has decided this is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the sun. Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George, and don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. Well, they're all aboard now. Oh, it's so wonderful to feel the wind. And the sun again. Close the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Sure, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this grace, the Zahn leaving Earth forever. Now oh, they're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's over now. Well, I suppose we... Might as well go back in. I still don't understand, Walter. What made them go? Oh, I uh, just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, no. Oh, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know at 7,000 years he was getting to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Uh, look out the step. Well... Do you remember when the first animals died? Yes, the rabbit and the canary. Mm -hmm, and their mates just started to pine and waste away. Yes. Well, that worried the Zahn. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. And so, finally, I broke down and told them about... affection. Affection? Mm -hmm. And then I, I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? Here we are. Oh. Come here. Grace, I want you to meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? Well, that's what the Zahn wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Mm -hmm. I even showed him how. Come here, fella. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Yes, I held Donald in my arms and petted him a while, and then... Then I let the Zahn take over with the animal in the next cave. What animal? Take a look. Hey, watch out. Don't go Water. too close. It's a rattlesnake. Yes, it's a rattlesnake. The Zahn's metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch they could be poisoned. Then it was the snake that killed the two Zahn. They never even knew what bit them. And you outwitted them, Walter. I suppose. And I thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so proud of you. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought at all if you hadn't pushed me. Uh, well. Well. We've got a world.
world to plan, a whole new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones would be safer to keep in. But first, there's a much bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. Yeah, we've got to make a decision about that. It's a pretty important one. Uh, yes, uh, but... It hasn't been a bad race. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but... Well, we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. Please, Walter. It's, it's the Garden of Eden. Oh, don't be ridiculous. All over again. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. <laughs> Funny. Even blush like Martha. Oh, 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 only you're stronger than she was. And prettier, too. I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear, if you'll only give me a little time. Now, Walter Fallon, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that, that we... Why, that... I, I, I thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. And so, Grace, if you could only... I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. Well, all right, my dear, but, but think it over and, and please come back. You see, I told you. It wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes... The last man on earth sat alone in the room. And then, there was a knock on the door. Come in. Oh, come in. Come in. My dear. You see, it wasn't horrible at all. have just heard the Frederick Brown story entitled Knock, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown world of the future, the world of Dimension X. 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 Now, about next week. Next week, we tell the story of a robot, but a robot that was almost human. Tonight's adventure in Dimension X was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Arnold Moss was heard as Walter Phelan, Louis Van Ruten as the Zahn, and Joan Alexander as Grace Evans. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Tomorrow, hear Sam Spade. Now it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston presents Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are on Venus on a farm where food is chemically grown in large tanks. As they walk toward a building where Tonga is held captive, huge sun mirrors atop several tall towers turn ominously toward them. Come up the rockets, Commander. It's really getting hot all of a sudden. Yes, waves of heat. Even for Venus, this is unusual. Gee, my eyes. What a glare. Don't look at those reflectors. They'll blind you. <laughs> Let's run for the building and get out of the sun. Happy look out. They're focusing those sun mirrors on us. A whole battery of them are pointed right toward us. Then we can dodge them. Run back this way. Commander, they've got us surrounded by the heat beams and they're closing in. They hit us with all of them at once. We're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Space Shark. 
It's the cereal of the future, the real space cereal. The cereal that's different from any other cereal in the universe. The cereal you see on Commander Corey's own breakfast table. Delicious Rice Chex. The cereal with a flavor like no other flavor in all the universe. Delicious Rice Chex. Swell tasting shredded rice spun in that modern bite sized design for easy eating. A real space cereal. You see, there's space inside those biscuits so they can fill up with milk or cream. Try it today, gang. The only bite sized rice cereal in the universe. Rice Checks. The one and only official checkerboard rice cereal. Rice Checks. One of the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. Rice Checks. At your grocers in the red and white checkerboard package. Get it today. Crisp and delicious. New and different. Golden bite size rice checks. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have just blasted off from the planet Saturn, where they've been investigating mysterious contamination of chemically grown food shipped from Venus. In the meantime, Tonga, the assistant security chief, is also doing some undercover investigation work on Venus, working as a chemist on one of the farms. Now, through the nose port of Terra 5, Buzz and Happy watch Saturn's shining rings looming up large before them. Raise our vector about five degrees, Happy. Want to clear the rings with plenty of space to spare. Yes, sir. You know, it's too bad anything so beautiful is such a menace to space flight. But by the time you're close enough for them to be a menace, the rings are no longer beautiful. No, because you can see the individual hunks of rock making up the rings. And yet from a distance, they look as though you could ride a surface car around them like on a smooth racetrack. Only well, in this case, it's the racetrack that does the moving. Well, it's 1,100 hours universal star time, Happy. We ought to be hearing from Tonga pretty soon. I hope she found out more about how that food is getting contaminated than we did. Well, those samples we examined on Saturn turned bad after they arrived from Venus. So maybe the chemical farm they came from is still pure, huh? Not necessarily. Perhaps a chemical with a delayed action was put into the hydroponic tanks. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Tonga calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Tonga. Commander, how soon can you come to Venus? We just blasted off from Saturn. It'll take at least three and a half hours. Something wrong? Why, no, to the contrary. I found out how those harmful chemicals are getting into the hydroponic tanks. Good. A group of racketeers are trying to force the farm operators to pay for protection. They've bribed workers to put the contaminating chemicals into the tanks. Then, for the owners who pay the price, the tanks stay pure. Who's behind this gang? I don't know yet, Commander, but I think I will by the time you reach Venus. Where are you now? In the woman's dormitory at the farm. I'm just about ready to report for work at the lab. If you leave your miniature space phone in your room, be sure you hide it carefully. I keep it with me, Commander. It's safer. You want us to come directly to the farm when we reach Venus? I'll let you know later, Commander. By the way, I'm working here as Miss Bird. All right, Tonga. Be careful. Corey out. Gee, Commander, Tonga seems to have found out more in a week than all the other agents have in a month. She's a good security department operator, Happy. Now, we'll clear the rings. Change the vector for Venus. Yes. Ready for the spectroscope check on specimen 28, Mr. Baxter? All right, Miss Williams. Hmm. Negative. Well, this whole group of samples says pure. I hope we have as good luck on the next group. Oh, never mind that now, Miss Burns. I'll handle it. Oh, but I thought you wanted all these samples analyzed before the morning shift ends. There isn't much more to do. I, uh, I'd like to have you take this report over to the superintendent's office. Why, yes, Mr. Baxter. She. I sent her on an errand. All right, that space patrol spy. I wonder how much she knows. Not very much. I've kept close watch on her ever since we found that she's a space patrol agent. But that was three days ago. She's been here a week. I'd like to know where she kept that space for. I had a room search at the woman's dormitory. She's got it hidden, all right. Perhaps it's under the floor. Baxter, you should have put this concealed microphone in her room in the first day she was here. Look, I can't handle everything. Oh, we got to get rid of her. Without exciting suspicion. How can we do that? The space patrol will investigate. Mm -hmm. Supposing there was an accident. Supposing she mixed the wrong chemicals and there was an explosion. Oh, she's too careful. Too smart. I, I've got it. This will do fine. 
What is that? A harmless chemical used by Miss Burns almost constantly. But this bottle... Someone might easily confuse the names of the two chemicals. They're very much alike. Mm. What does this chemical do? A few drops mixed with any acid solution will produce a deadly gas. The gas it soon dissipates. After a few seconds, when it's mixed with air, it's harmless. Mm. But if someone were leaning over a container of it when it first formed... Mm -hmm. Baxter, I can pronounce the name of the substance, but it's the solution to our problem. Mm -hmm. Fix it up. I better get out of here before she gets back. The superintendent said he'd check the report later, Mr. Baxter. <laughs> Typical. He hollers his head off for something, then lets it sit on his desk for three days. Miss Burns, would you take over here? Of course. I've got to rush over to tank number five. I'll be back as soon as possible. Right, Mr. Baxter. Mm. Now, let's see. Hemispheric acid, 20 cc's. Oh, now, where is it? Oh, here it is. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Work table. Is the gas dissipated? Do you think I'd be walking around like this if it hadn't? As I told you, it only takes a few seconds for the... Baxter, she's alive, huh? Look at her. She's moving, tugging at her throat. She must have jerked her head back before it got into her lungs. Now what do we do? This makes it awkward. Let me... Well, at this acceleration, we'll reach Venus in half an hour, sir. Want me to take over? <laughs> no, thanks, sir. I'd just as soon bring her in, if I may. Well, fine with me. Listen, I heard something in a miniature space phone. So did I. I got her back, sir. We lowered our Miss Burns into the surface car and take her to my hyperdramic farm. Huh? Oh, somebody sees us. Tell them there was a slight accident. We can say I'm a doctor and take her to the hospital. But, Commander, they've done something to Tom. Quiet, Happy. I take her to your farm. When she comes to, we can make her tell how much she knows. We certainly can't work on her hair. That's right, I'll stay here and watch Miss Burns. We got to get a surface car. Go on, get moving. Tonga managed to click on her space of phones. So she's probably not too badly hurt. I wish they'd keep talking so we could find out who they are and where they're going to take her. Baxter and Eagle. Eagle has a chemical food farm. Happy you keep listening to your miniature set. I'll contact Venus Space Control and have them check on the location of a hydroponic farm owned by a man named Eagle. Our passenger seems to be very quiet back there. Well, apparently that gas just missed being totally effective. Here, pull up in front of this building. What's this place? Mm, a couple of storage rooms and a solar mirror control. Quite a layout you have. Yeah, very successful farm, Baxter. And you know, I haven't had a bit of trouble with contaminated food. I wonder why. I wonder why. Oh, well, come to think of it, maybe I'd better have some trouble in case the space patrol starts wondering why. Well, come on. Let's get her out of the car. She's still unconscious. We'll have to carry her. Yeah, all right. Let's go. <coughs> Spaceship. It's landing. Quick, get her inside. The space patrol ship. Why do you suppose it's coming here? That's the commander ship. I've seen it a dozen of times on Terra. He must know the whole deal. How could he? Ah, the girl kept him out. Probably has been waiting for days for some open move on our part. Uh, what do we do with her? Where's one of those storage rooms? Oh, wait. There isn't time for that now. Bring her in here. We got to stop Corey. Stop? How? Oh. Uh, set her down here. Look, why don't we lock her up out of sight? Maybe we can bluff Corey out of it. He can't know anything. Well, he's obviously been to the other farm and knows the girl was taken away in a surface car. Well, nobody asked us any questions. No, but several people saw us. Why don't we get in the car again and get away from here? And be followed by Corey's spaceship? I'm not anxious to tangle with Corey. We won't have to. Come here. I'll show you something that will take care of. Commander, 
Commander, I'm not sure, but I thought I saw two men carrying Tonga into that building down there uh, when we were landing the ship. That means she's still unconscious. Yes, we've got to be careful, Happy. It's lucky she managed to turn on her miniature spacer phone. And even when Eagle and Baxter weren't talking, you picked up the sound of the surface car motor and led us right here. This farm is more than just a front. Looks like a well-run operation. Well, then why does Milton Eagle get mixed up in a gang of racketeers? Well, very likely he's one of the higher-ups, if not the kingpin. This protection racket is his way of controlling competition. Well, what are those big, shiny pieces of metal on top of the towers? Those are solar mirrors, Happy. They can be focused on the food tanks to raise the temperature. Mm. Some of them seem to be moving now. Uh, they have to keep pace with the sun. Also, if the mirrors were kept focused on one tank too long, it would scorch the plants, probably boil the water. Oh, I see. I'm not so sure our rival hasn't aroused interest, Happy, so be on your guard. Get the idea now, Baxter? I'm surrounding Corey and the cadet with circles of concentrated sunlight. What do you expect to do? Blind them with the glare? Yeah. Wait till I converge all those beams in one spot. Right on Corey and his friend. Hegel. Well, you realize the heat those mirrors put out? <laughs> yeah, quite well, Baxter. And I think this will serve to stop the space patrol permanently. Now watch. I'm going to bring the focal points together. Gee, Commander, it sure is getting hot all of a sudden. Yes, waves of heat. Even for Venus, this is unusual. Smoking rockets, my eyes. What a glare. Don't look at those reflectors. They're blind to it. Let's run for the building and get out of the sun. Happy, they're focusing those sun mirrors on us. There's a whole battery of them. Maybe we can dodge them. Run back this way. Hey, Commander, we're surrounded by heat beams, and they're closing in. They hit us with all those at once. We're finished. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Right now, here's the story of a cosmic surface car in trouble. Listen. The trouble? Nothing to go on but ordinary fuel. You hear that? The driver's filling up the tank with super fuel. Now, something's going to happen now. Boy, that cosmic surface car is really roaring now. That's because it's supercharged with super fuel. And the same is true with you, gang. What happens when you don't have a good breakfast? You're just a putt-putt. But when you fill up your tank with super fuel, man, you're supercharged. Now, here's how Buzz Corey does it. He eats a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal, rice checks or wheat checks. Wait till you taste them, gang. Boy, are they good. Flavor galore in every crisp, bite-sized biscuit. So get going, gang. Eat a good super cereal breakfast and get supercharged. Get the super cereals today. Rice checks, wheat checks. <laughs> Buzz and Happy are on the grounds of a chemically grown food plant on Venus in an attempt to rescue Tonga, abducted by two men who've been putting poisonous chemicals in the food tanks of competing operators. The two conspirators, Milton Eagle and Richard Baxter, have seen Buzz and Happy approach the building where they're holding Tonga. Eagle has focused several sun mirrors toward the two space patrolmen, surrounding them with heat beams. Inch by inch, the circles close in around Buzz and Happy as Eagle tightens the wall of searing heat. Look at them, Baxter. Ah, they can't move in any direction. The grass all around them is burnt. <laughs> yeah, uh, and a few seconds ago it was fresh and green. Oh, it must be stifling inside those beams. Look at them, even from here you can tell they're gasping for air. Well, we might as well finish them off. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, grab her, Baxter. Let go of me. Get your hands off of that panel. Pull her away, Baxter. I'm trying to. Let go of me. Find her, come away. Let go of me. I've got her, Eagle. Now I'll finish off Corey and... Uh, she cut off the beam. Get them on, quickly. There is in time. Corey and the cadet are headed toward us. Drag the girl out to the surface car. Quick. Quit struggling, dear. Take your hands off me. Uh, we haven't got time to pamper you, Miss Burns. <laughs> there. Uh, now you can carry her. And hurry up into the car. We're getting into the surface car. They've got stronger. Hurry up. Stop. Hey, come back here. <laughs> No use, Hat. I've gone in a few more steps and we'd have made it. Back to the ship. We'll blast off and trace them. They won't be able to get far. It was 
was close. Huh? Plenty close. We aren't away yet. They look for us with their ship. Maybe put up a roadblock. Found it, girl. Why don't we get rid of her for good? Throw her out of the car. No, you fool. As long as she's what asked for, you won't get robbed. Where, where are you taking me? That's a good question. Where are we taking her? Uh, we're going to blast off for Neptune. Blasting off for Neptune? In the surface, car? You must really have knocked your silly ankle. <laughs> I got a spaceship in a private spaceport a couple of miles from here. With a little luck, we can blast off before Corey spots us. With a little oh, luck, I think we I've can got him, sir, on the miniature set. Yeah, that's them all. Right. Out of the car. You're just even driving to me. What's the girl? Where on Neptune are you taking me? To a place where the space patrol will never find you. I suppose you've got a hideout in the mountains somewhere. No, not quite. There's a small settlement along the Crawlock River, just about 60 views east of Neptune City, where we won't be found. Wouldn't the big city be better? People wouldn't ask so many questions. I know what I'm doing. Well, we know where they're going to take her. Hope we can rescue Tonga before they get her aboard the spaceship. Hey, Commander, there's a surface car down there on the highway. Do you suppose that's the one? Very likely. Let's cut down our speed. The spaceport isn't much further, Baxter. What kind of spaceship do you have? My, such an inquisitive woman. But I'll tell you, I'm rather proud of it. It's a Class B space cruiser, one of the largest private ships made. A Class B space cruiser? How nice. It must be Venus Registry, then. Yes, Venus Registry. Anything else you want to know? Hegel, we're being followed. Yeah, by a surface car. Uh, none showing on a highway radar. No, a spaceship is pretty high up, but it's hovering. There's some binoculars in the compartment. See if you can make out what ship it is. All right. I don't like the looks of it. Why would a spaceship be traveling so slowly over this part of Venus? Uh, it's changing direction now. I can get these glasses, folks. It's a space patrol ship. Terra 5. Corey again. Uh, maybe you didn't see us after all. Uh, there were other surface cars on a highway near my farm. Wonder how we happened to follow this one. That's strange. Miss Burns, why do you keep playing with that locket? Why, I... I didn't know I was. Give me that. How dare you? Oh, rather large for a locket, isn't it? Snap it open. Uh, now, isn't this interesting? Yeah, what is it, Baxter? A miniature space phone. So that's how Corey's been able to find us. We really ought to fix this girl now. Shut up, you fool. Turn that space phone off. Just a minute, Eagle. I know where you are and what you're up to. If either you or Baxter harm Tonga, both of you will regret it the rest of your lives. Well, your real name is Tonga, the assistant security chief. That's right. Corey, I got a proposition to make to you. What is it? If we turn Tonga loose, will you let us alone? You know I couldn't make a bargain like that. I'm willing to take a gamble, Corey. I know you'll keep after us, but I'll trade Tonga for a few minutes' time. There's a small check a few hundred yards down the highway. I'll leave Tonga there. How about it, Corey? It's your best chance to get her back safely. All right, Eagle. I'll get you anyway, but I warn you, don't try to double-cross me. They cut the space up on her back, sir. It's off. Uh, here's the shack. We got to work fast. Corey's landing right where I figured he would. Stay behind the trees until he's out of the ship. Why don't we get in the car and get to your ship? Why waste time? While Corey is in the shack rescuing Tonga, we'll put his weapons out of commission. Why not wreck the control so he can't blast off? Yeah, and have him alert other space patrol units? Our best bet is to have Corey after us himself. Tell me your ship is faster than Terra 5. No, but his ship isn't faster than the shark. The shark? Yeah, it's a cosmic missile with a special view scope device. I have one aboard my ship. And once it's launched at Corey's ship, he can dodge it or outrun it. Yes, and with his own cosmic weapons out of commission, he can't fire at the shark. That's right. He can run all over the solar system. But sooner or later, the shark will get him. Come on, get ready. Corey and the cadet are getting out of the ship. Here's the shack, sir. I sure hope they kept their word and left Tonga here. Eagle and Baxter are putting a lot of faith in a few minutes' head start. It won't do them much good. Try the door, huh? Thanks. Commander, happy. Are you all right, Tonga? Yes, Commander. Oh, they've got her tied, hand and foot. I could give them more time. They probably would have locked the door if they could. Here, I'll cut those ropes, Tonga. Thank you, Commander. I tried to find out exactly where Eagle's spaceship was. All I know is that it's not too far from here. Happy and I looked for it from the air, but it must have been here. Hey, listen... The ship blasting off. Probably Eagles. 
Let's see. By the time we walk through the woods back to our ship, well, they'll have about five minutes start on us. Five minutes? Well, that isn't going to do them much good. They picked us up, Abel. Good. Now let's give Corey a run for his money. When are you going to launch the guided missiles at them? Well, we'll wait till they get closer. First, we leave Corey out of the regular lane. I don't want him to call for help when we launch the target. Gaining very fast, sir. They must realize they can't escape. Turn on the space phone, Happy. I'll order them to surrender. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, the Milton Eagle aboard Private Cruiser 398. Come in. Eagle to Commander Corey. Is something wrong, Commander? Eagle, the smartest thing you can do is surrender. Head for Saturn. It's the closest planet. Sorry. We have other plans. I order you to surrender. We're armed, you know. Oh, of course. Happy, stand by to fire a warning rocket. Yes, sir. Eagle, I don't want to use force unless it's necessary, but I'm prepared to do it. Commander, something's wrong with the firing mechanism. What? Huh? The electronic controls are out of order. What about number two? Well, they're all out of order, sir. That's right, Commander. Baxter and I took care of that while you were rescuing Tonga. We can still overtake you, Eagle. Meanwhile, we can call units from Saturn. You're going to be pretty busy, Commander. Baxter and I are sending you a present. Catch. Eagle, if you fire on a space patrol ship, you'll be blasted out of space. Commander, look at the view scope. Something's leaving their ship. It's not a regular missile, sir. It's too slow. It may seem slow now, Cadet, but wait. Eagle, what did you just release? A weapon with your picture on it, Commander. It's gaining velocity, sir. It's a guided type missile with a cosmic warhead. Have fun. Eagle out. Happy. Change vector for Saturn. For Saturn, sir? Yes, and put on all the acceleration we can stand. Getting closer, Commander. Head for Saturn's rings, Happy. For the rings? Yes. Get on a tangent with the outer ring. All right, sir. But, well, Commander... Yes, sir. The rings are made up of big chunks of rock. If we get too close... That's the idea, Tonga. We'll get as close as possible. We're going to let those rocks run interference for us. What an idea. Just like football at technology school. Uh, blocking back, trailing you. Tonga, right, uh, bring the forward view scope up to full sensitivity. We'll pick out a nice big rock. Yes, Commander. Missile's awfully close, sir. At this rate, it'll hit us in a few seconds. But there's a giant hunk of rock dead ahead. Good. I'll take the controls now, Happy. I'm going to see how close I can come to that rock. Tonga, watch the rear view scope. The missile's awfully close. Fine. We're going to jaywalk right in front of that rock. <gasps> wow. Oh, boy, was that close. Smoking rockets, have you ever seen such fine? Watch the rear view scope. The rock. It blew up right behind us. Guided missile hit it. Well, that was luck. Luck? Nothing. That was the trickiest spaceship piloting in the universe, Commander. You hit a guided missile with an unguided missile. Now, let's take care of some unfinished business. Eagle and Baxter. How are we going to find them now? I don't think it'll be difficult. They figure we're out of the way, so they might go back to their original plan. The crawl up river place? We'll try it. Take over, Happy. We're clear of the ring. Well, I lined up another ship for us, Baxter. Good. When do we leave Krolak? In a few hours. One of my men is bringing a ship in from Neptune City. Oh, it can't be too soon to suit me. I don't like this place. Ah, what are you so jittery about? We don't have to worry about Corey anymore. I know. I just don't like Neptune. I'm used to Venus. You get plenty of sunshine. Get your hands up, Eagle. You right. too, Baxter. Corey. Get the weapons, Happy. Yes, sir. Hey, Corey, uh, how did you... The, the guided missile, you, you couldn't have escaped the shark. The shark, if that's what you call it, stubbed its nose on a rock just off Saturn. As a pet, it wasn't too trustworthy. You were so sure you'd finished, Corey, I told you not to come here. No, nah, no, nah, Baxter. No recrimination. We gambled and we lost. Take it easy, Baxter. Like me. No, you don't, Ego. All right. Now, Ego. Are you ready to come along? Yeah. yeah sure. Oh, okay, Corey. I... I'll come along. Yeah, you know, uh, you're not very agile, Eagle. Uh, you'd better stick to taking it easy, like Baxter. <laughs> An exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol story in just a moment. Hey, watch out. Hold everything. Here he comes down the rink so fast his ice skates are melting the ice. Wow, that's a checkerboard kid. He's supercharged. 
and a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal did it. A breakfast with swell-tasting instant Ralston. Uh-oh, here he comes again. Stand back. Jumpin' Jupiter, that boy's a winner. He's got the speed of Buzz Corey himself. And how about you, gang? How about getting supercharged so you can whiz along just like that? Just do this. Have a good breakfast with Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal. The delicious hot cereal that helps to turn on your starter. Makes you bright as a light and helps to keep you right on the beam. That's what it does for the commander. That's what it'll do for you. Uh-oh, here comes the checkerboard kid again on those flying ice skates. Don't wait, gang. Be a winner yourself. Get supercharged. Eat a good breakfast with a delicious hot super cereal, Instant Ralston. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy and their spacesuits on a tiny asteroid are approaching a criminal who has stolen evidence that's needed to convict a crime syndicate. He's got the metal box, sir, with the evidence. All right, Chora. Come out of that crater and get into our ship. I'm getting into my own ship, Corey. And you're not going to stop me. All right, we'll come down and get you. Take one more step and I'll use this gun on you. All right, have it your way. I warned you. Drop, Happy. Uh Wow, that was close. The gun chipped a hunk of rock loose as big as your head. Stand still, Happy. I think Chora means business. Yeah, he does. And it isn't funny business either. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Search for Asteroid X, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs> And now, an important message from Commander Buzz Corey. Did you ever read in the paper about a boy or girl saving somebody's life? Ever wish you could do something like that? Well, you can. Just join my Space Patrol blood boosters. Uh, Here's what we do. We try to get more people to donate blood to the Red Cross. When you get somebody to donate blood, you save a life. So, boys and girls, join my Space Patrol blood boosters today. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Nina Berra. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! (laughs) And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. You have been listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.